Yes. Can I start, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah. Good evening, friends. Welcome to the 33rd episode of our ISA Pudukote branch online weekly webinar Pudukote Pudan. Today, we are focusing on thoracic anesthesia topics valuable for postgraduates and practicing anesthesiologists. I invite our secretary, Dr. Priyasamy, for the welcome address. Over to Dr. Priyasamy. Thank you, sir. Uh, respected academic chairman, Dr. Yael Minashundram, sir, President Dr. Suresh Kumar, sir, and President Dr. Devi, uh, members of IACA Pudukotai and delegates, I welcome you all on behalf of IACA Pudukotai for yes. this weekly webinar program, Pudukotai Budan. Today, we are having three important topics. One is anesthetic management of anterior mediastinal mass, and another one is anesthetic management of carotid endotomy, and third one is anatomy of tracheobranchial tree and uh, FOB guidance. For this, I welcome Dr. Uh, S. Kumar sir again. I think he is coming regularly as our uh, IAC member. This is a great honor for us, sir. And I welcome you for this session as a chairperson. Uh, uh, sorry, senior consultant and uh, head of cardiac anesthesiology and critical care, Minach Mission Hospital and Research Center, Madurai. Uh, once, once again, I welcome you, sir. And for this program, uh, Dr. Saravana Babu, Associate Professor, Division of Ca Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia, C. Chitrai Tirunal Institute of, for Medical Science and Technology. Trivandrum. Uh, Sir is going to talk about anesthetic management of anterior mediastinal mass. I welcome you, sir. Next topic uh, is going to talk about by Dr. Don Josh Palamatam, Assistant Professor, Division of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia, Sri Chitrai Trinal Institute for Medical Science and Technology, Trivandrum. Sir is going to talk about Anesthetic management of carotid endorectomy. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of IHA Pudukote. And third topic is uh, anatomy of tracheobranchial tree and FAB uh, guidance. Uh, this is going to talk by Dr. Uh, Muhammad Jafar Sarif, uh, DM resident, Division of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia, Sri Chitrai Trinal Institute for Medical Science and Technology, Trivandrum. I welcome you, sir. I welcome you all for this 33rd academic program of online webinar program. And this program already, uh, you know about this program. This has been uh, accredited by Tamil Nadu Medical Council and they are giving credit to us. Uh, and we, uh, for that, we need certain details. I will join it again uh, in the chat box after some time. Uh, thing is, we have to uh, we need uh, your uh, attendance certificate, attendance identification, and uh, email ID uh, for this uh, credit towers uploading. So don't forget to pay uh, uh, 100 rupees. Uh, and it is to be paid to our account number. Uh, this is given here. You can note it down. And one more thing is our IACA national election is going on from. Uh, November 1st to November 5th. So I request all the members to vote for your, can, your candidate without file. So the carotid artery is the more important artery which is supplying our whole brain as internal, internal and external. Small poem about that. Uh, carotid artery external and internal on either side. Carrying blood to the neck and brain to feed Rejoin each other through the circle of bilis. Regulate the blood flow and pressure of brain is the main cause. Carotid blood climbs against the gravity, giving important higher function 
or the BT. The rotated banner receptor and heber stop present for pressure and pH regulations. Occlusion and alteration of flow will affect all brain function. So always fill carotids and preserve carotids. Better for better brain function because of better brain function because of carotid with this. Thank you for for watching this uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, over to President ISEA Pudukkote. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Periyasamy, for your welcome address and your poem on Karoti Doctors. Uh, respected Secretary Treasurer of our bench, respected Dr. A.L. Meena Chundaram, sir, our academic chairman of our Pudukkote ISEA branch. Today's Chief Guest and Chief <coughs> Chief Guest and our uh, Chairperson Dr. Kumar Sir, heroes of today's topics Dr. Saravana Babu, Dr. Don Jos Palamatam, and Dr. Mohammed Jafar Sharif, all from uh, Chitra Thirunal Institute of Medical Sciences, Thiruvananthapuram, members, delegates, and postgraduates watching this CME. As President of ISA, I once again extend my welcome and greetings. Today's topic is of important, but the, in, uh, the fact is, or uh, the beauty is, the speakers were from eminent institution. That is a premier institution in our India country. So the Chitra Thirunal Institute of Medical Sciences. The topics were uh, nicely chosen by our academic chairman, Dr. Ayalam Sir. I think the, we have a very good uh, lecture ahead. So I... I am a I am a Welcome everybody I for this session and give your attention to this topic and participate in the uh, discussions at the end. Thank you. And I over the I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Ayalam sir to conduct this CME. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, uh, President, sir, a respected uh, President, Secretary, and members of ISA Pudukotai, and a distinguished uh, faculty today. Yeah, good evening to all. Two things. One, ISA national elections are going on. I request all of you to vote without fail. And uh, today in our area, there is a heavy rain. Uh, even the roads are uh, flooded with uh, rainwater. I don't know how long my internet connectivity will be stable. But amidst this juncture, I am very happy to have distinguished faculty from Sri Chitratranal Medical College and Dr. Saravana Babu, who is keen to take part in uh, medical education, was very much willing to deliver a lecture in this Purukotai Budan. What I want to convey now he is a man of uh, Tamil Nadu. He is actually he belongs to Kanchipuram and he got uh, his MBBS graduation from Chakalpat Medical College and MD from uh, Kanpur Medical College and he has done his uh, DM cardiac anesthesiology in um, uh, Chitra Thirunal. And not stopping with that, he got fellowship in all the subspecialties of uh, Cardiology, I think only Dr. Kumar can interpret what are all the fellowships he has acquired because he got uh, trans esophageal echocardiography, then fellowship in cardiovascular anesthesia in Canada, a Toronto hospital. And he is having a special competence in uh, TEE, which is certified by National Board of Electrocardiography, United States. And he is interested as such in cardiothoracic anesthesia, that is why he is in uh, Chitra Thirunal. He is interested in fast tracking of uh, pediatric cardiac surgical procedures and the publications uh, he has done uh, is more than 50. He has done, published in national as well as uh, international uh, journals and he is the topper in uh, university topper in MD anesthesia examination. So I think only our uh, chairperson can match his uh, standard. So we are not aware of all these uh, intricacies in uh, cardiac anesthesiology. And he is associate professor in uh, Chitra Thirunal. And he is assisted by uh, assistant professor, Dr. Don Jose uh, Palamattam. 
he is also a dm cardiac uh, anesthesia qualified person from sri chitratrnal and he worked uh, for a brief period in nims hyderabad uh, and he graduated from osmania medical college uh, hyderabad and he is a junior consultant in cardiovascular anesthesia department for some time in gachbowli hospital hyderabad and after dm he is working in uh, sri chitratrnal he is also interested in as such any cardiac anesthesiologist he is interested in echocardiography and uh, resident this is the first time we are having a peculiar resident usually our residents will not be qualified in anesthesia that is how we pick up resident but at this time this resident is qualified in anesthesia because he has done his md and he is a dm cardiac resident in that way he is coming as a post graduate but the first time a post graduate is coming with a qualification in pudukottai budan he is none other than mohammed jafar sharif he is a second year uh, resident and incidentally he has also done his mbbs in tamil nadu that is muthukumaran medical college so md he did from maulana azad medical college and just because he is interested in thoracic and vascular anesthesia he joined in uh, chitratrnal but uh, he got honors in pharmacology spm general medicine general surgery if i quote all mbbs subjects i have to quote so he has uh, done that and uh, he is a uh, got accreditation from uh, brls and acls so these three are uh, top most qualified people and all are qualified first time so again we don't have any other alternative except to approach dr kumar to be the chairperson to moderate because uh, he is the leader in this uh, profession and he is working in uh, meenakshi mission hospital for many years for two decades he is working and in, even though he is working in uh, cardiac anesthesia department he is ever smiling so he will never have any problem in the coronary circulation Uh, and he will not make uh, others also to suffer from uh, coronary blockage so he is such a nice man so the academic competence of kumar if i start saying it will go for uh, minimum 20 minutes so he is such a excellent uh, speaker academically inclined dedicated to the core he is the expert in cardiovascular anesthesia and uh, to buffer all these three to coordinate all these three none other than uh, dr kumar can do the job uh, in uh, tamil nadu that too with a trademark smile of uh, kumar so we requested him and he readily obliged just because it is his topic now i hand over the session to our chairperson uh, dr kumar so he can coordinate who is going to come first who is going to come second uh, over to uh, dr kumar thank you thank you sir thank you very much sir for your greater kind kind words <laughs> thank you very much uh, respected president isa pudukottai dr suresh kumar sir secretary dr periya sami sir academic chairman the most dynamic academician of tamil nadu not only tamil nadu isa national professor dr al minash sir sir treasurer dr david members of isa pudukottai members of isa tamil nadu and all members who are, who are attending from other states also post graduates and my dear friends very good evening to everyone at the outset uh, i would like to thank pudukottai budan and the entire uh, isa pudukottai team they are doing extremely good job and they are continuously conducting this for more than 60 meetings i am not uh, sure about the number because i am attending from first meeting and then in between 50th meeting and they are marching towards 100 so my best wishes and congratulations for reaching that 100 very soon and special thanks to the most dynamic person most dynamic uh, person of tamil nadu representing tamil nadu to the whole nation professor dr el mina shudra sir i always admire not only for his academic uh, activities more than that is tamil is phenomenal he has received more awards for tamil than the anesthesia fraternity 
that is really appreciable from our iisa fraternity uh, real best wishes sir for taking tamil to next level and coming to the topics today we had excellent uh, speakers from one of my favorite institute sri chitra dirnal my favorite uh, teachers and uh, seniors are there dr thomas koshi dr srinivas and my good friends dr sunil and uh, dr unni from that we had uh, we have uh, three topics uh, management of anterior medial mass and then management of carotid endotracheotomy and third one is about uh, anatomy of tracheobronchial tree with uh, fob guidance and we have uh, three excellent speakers dr sarvana babu that the speakers already introduced by our academic chairman dr meena chandra sir so they know uh, don't repeat and need any introduction further so dr sarvana babu is going to talk on anterior medial mass and then dr don jose we going to talk on carotid endotomy and third topic will be uh, anatomy of tracheobronchial tree with the fob guidance by dr jafar jafar was with us in meenakshi for some time and then he left for dm so he is extremely brilliant person so with this few introduction we'll go to the first topic the first topic is going to be on anesthetic management of mediastinal mass you all know about that the difficulty of mediastinal mass management when you encounter only you'll realize that it is not that easy if it is adherent to the trachea if it is adherent to the airway it is adherent to the uh, cardiac structures definitely it is going to be a nightmare for managing this anterior mediastinal mass those things and the major uh, thing expected is respiratory compromise and hemodynamic compromise those things has to be learned before proceeding for the uh, management of this type of cases we have a very good speaker for that i invite dr sarana babu to proceed with the management of anterior mediastinal mass over to dr sarana babu please Hello, good evening, sir. Uh, hope I am audible and my slides are visible. Yeah, visible, sir. Very well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kumar, sir, for uh, giving your warm introduction, and uh, I thank Dr. Uh, Minakshi Sundaram, sir, and the entire ISA Pudukkotte team for inviting our team from Sri Chitra for uh, delivering uh, lectures in the ISA Pudukkotte branch. It's uh, Pudukkotte Bodhan online weekly schedule program. So, as I said, if I go to my topic, I don't want to waste time. so uh, today my topic given was for uh, uh, giving anesthesia for anterior mediastinal mass so uh, there is no conflict of interest on my topic and uh, so uh, the outline of my presentation today i am going to discuss about the anatomy and pathophysiology of the anterior mediastinal mass and the clinical signs and symptoms what these patients may present with and the preoperative evaluation for anesthesia and uh, the surgical procedures and the preoperative medical treatment for the anterior mediastinal mass before sur undergoing surgery and the anesthetic management and the complications and the risk factors for the uh, perioperative period and uh, a few cases i will discuss as, uh, 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 here and uh, finally i will conclude with a good summary so coming to the anatomy so we all know that uh, the mediastinum extends from the thoracic inlet from above to the diaphragm below so uh, the mediastinum is divided into anterior and, and uh, inferior superior and inferior mediastinum by an imaginary line which runs from angle of louis anteriorly to the fourth and fifth intercos i mean uh, intervertebral space posteriorly so it divides the mediastinum into a superior mediastinum and the inferior mediastinum the line the mediastinum above this line is the superior mediastinum and below this line is the inferior mediastinum further the inferior mediastinum is divided into three parts uh, the structures anterior to the heart are considered to be the anterior mediastinum and the heart and the uh, contents of the heart are considered to be the middle mediastinum and the structures coming in the uh, posterior part that is posterior to the heart are considered to be the posterior mediastinum in this way the mediastinum has been divided into four the superior mediastinum anterior mediastinum middle mediastinum and the posterior mediastinum so if you see here the contents of the mediastinum uh the, the superior mediastinum uh, is involves the thymus the aortic arch and the superior vena cava brachiocephalic vein thoracic duct and it mostly contains the vascular structures and the anterior mediastinum contains the thymus 
and the internal mammary arteries and the internal thoracic vein as well as some lymph nodes so the middle mediastinum as i already told it contains the heart and the great vessels as well as the um, ascending aorta pulmonary trunk and the svc lower part of svc draining into the ra as well as the uh, pulmonary veins which are draining into the posterior part of the heart as well as the vagus nerve and the phrenic nerve so posterior part of the mediastinum mostly contains the uh, nervous structures like sympathetic chains vagus nerve esophagus thoracic aorta and amesoigos veins and thoracic duct so today our main topic of concern is the is the anterior part of the mediastinum that includes the most important structure the thymus which is uh, especially uh, the most common cause for uh, uh, any uh, tumors or uh, uh, any benign or malignant tumors in children as well as in the adult and so whenever uh, the anterior compartment anteriorly it is bounded by the sternum and posteriorly by the cardiac structures so if you see in this uh, 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 diagram uh, the anterior mediastinum any mass in the anterior mediastinum if it goes uh, uh, superiorly it may uh, may have chances to uh, cause the mass effect on the uh, iota as well as the superior vena cava whereas whereas Whereas, am I audible? There is some noise disturbance, is there? Sorry. Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yes, 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 doctor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, if it goes posteriorly, it may uh, involve produce a mass effects on the heart as well as the uh, cardiac chambers. So, the anterior mediastinal mass is the most important. as dr dr kumar told it may cause a compressive effects on the airway as well as on the hemodynamic structures of the heart and great vessels so coming to the patho, 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 pathology what are the pathologies which can happen in the uh, superior anterior middle and posterior mediastinum there may be there are malignant as well as benign tumors as well as masses like aortic aneurysms may happen in the superior mediastinum which may cause a compressive effect on the trachea as well as the thyroid may come sometimes uh, come into the uh, superior mediastinum as a retrosternal thyroid and uh, it may cause a compressive effects on the airway so coming to the anterior mediastinum today topic of interest though it is at, uh, it has both uh, uh, benign as well as uh, uh, malignant lesions in adults the benign lesions were the thymoma thymic cyst and thymic hyperplasia these may not have much uh, infiltrative effects on the surrounding structure so these can be uh, uh, taken out with surgery but it may cause produce some mass effects so that is a compression of the airway and hemodynamic structures whereas the malignant uh, tumors are always like carcinomas of the thyroid and thymic and seminoma germ cell tumors which not only producing the uh, mass effects it may also create uh, infiltrative effects where the removal of the tumor is very tough and uh, if it touch that then it may land up in vascular injuries or airway injuries for children the most common type of uh, tumors in anterior mediastinum were the teratoma lymphoma and cystic agram all these were benign tumors so they may not uh, apart from causing the mass effects they may not have any much uh, infiltrative effects or anything on the patient so coming to the pathophysiology so what are the issues these mass can have so as you see in this diagram so there is a, a thymus sitting anteriorly if you see the relationship of this thymus if the patient develops a thymic carcinoma or a thymoma or whatever it is if the thymus starts to enlarge so adjacent adjacent to this mass cable see the mass adjacent to the mass there is a superior vena cava if it if it if it enlarges towards this way so it may cause some compressive effect on the superior vena cava and decreases the venous return from the upper limb uh, and uh, so it may produce some dilatation of veins all the symptoms of uh, superior vena cava syndrome and if it extends further up and or behind it may have a trachea is running behind it so it may have some compressive effects on the trachea and may produce the narrowing of the tracheal lumen and patients may develop dyspnea strider and uh, 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 a wheeze all those things uh, it, it may have some mass effect on the trachea as well as on the bronchi depending upon the site which the mass grows as well as if you see the pulmonary artery below this uh, uh, thymus if if it goes in this area it may cause some compressive effect on the pulmonary artery and if it goes below it may cause some compressive effect on the right ventricle and the right ventricular outflow tract causing uh, producing a significant hypoxemia and uh, desaturation so the pathophysiology lies depends upon the mass which uh, depends upon the mass where it goes and compresses the whether it compresses the airway or it compresses the cardiovascular structures 
so uh, if, if if the mask if the mask compresses the cardiovascular structures it may compress the cardiac chambers as i told you. it may compress the rv the right ventricular outflow tract and uh, it may present with patients may present with arrhythmias pericardial effusion and due to the compression of the cardiac chambers, the preload to the left ventricle will be de decreased as the mass is sitting on the right ventricle and the outflow to the left ventricle is reduced. So it may reduce, it may result in a cardiac output reduction. So uh, if it obstructs the SVC, as you all know that the uh, entire venous return from the upper body comes through the SVC to the right uh, atrium. So if it compresses the SVC, there will be a decrease in venous return and also there will be decreased preload to the left ventricle. And so it ultimately results in the reduction of the cardiac output. So if it compresses the pulmonary artery, there will be reduced blood flow to the pulmonary artery. So the lungs will uh, be, get reduced blood flows. So the patient will, will result in uh, 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 hypoxemia because the, uh, uh, the bloods are not oxygenated. And uh, it may result, it may also increase an afterload to the right ventricle because the pulmonary artery is the outflow tract of the uh, right ventricle. If it gets compressed, the right ventricle uh, resistance is increased. So the right ventricle may go in for acute RV dysfunction and suddenly the patient may crash. So uh, this is the pathophysiology of the patients who may present with the uh, 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 anterior mediastinal mass. These are the things we may encounter uh, in the intraoperative period. Uh, so coming to the clinical presentation of the ACE patients, these patients will have these symptoms when they present to the outpatient department. They may have symptoms, cough, uh, hoarseness of voice. Is, this is due to the involvement of the dyspnea and cough, maybe due to compressive effects on the RV and hoarseness of voice, maybe due to compressive effects on the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, resulting in vocal cord dysfunction. And there will be a new onset of V's. Some patients may develop syncope and chest pain, and due to the reduced preload pre from the uh, SVC compression, so the uh, cardiac output is reduced in these patients. So these patients may develop the symptoms of low cardiac output like syncope and chest pain. And also due to the tumor effects, they may have some weight loss dysphagia. If there is a compression of the esophagus posterior. If the tumor is large enough to compress the esophagus posteriorly. So most important uh, 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 clinical history we have to ask with the patient whether the dyspnea or cough, whether it changes with any positional change. For example, the tumor is sitting on the trachea and if the patient and sits, sits up or sits in upright position or turns laterally, the tumor may fall out of the uh, uh, structures like trachea or uh, uh, the vascular structures and uh, the symptoms may reduce. So the most important history, which, uh, which is useful in the risk stratification of these patients is the positional change, any improvement in symptoms. So this history as anesthesiologists, we should be aware and, and this will guide us for a proper perioperative management of these kind of patients. So uh, as I already told, uh, compressing the trachea, these patients may have obstructive, uh, sorry, uh, compressing the superior vena cava, these patients may land up in a superior vena cava syndrome, which is characterized by the obstructive symptoms, like the edema of the upper body, like face, neck, uh, larynx, and upper limbs, and dilated veins over the neck and thorax. And uh, there may be CS, uh, CNS symptoms because the venous drainage is reduced. So the patient may develop a, a venous, uh, 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 cerebral venous edema, so that may cause a, 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 a headache, visual distortions, and altered mentation due to the increase in the uh, ICP because the venous drainage from the brain is affected due to the compression of the superior vena cava. And uh, the respiratory symptoms may occur due to the compression of the airway by the tumor or the engorged veins. If the veins are very much engorged because of the obstruction of the SVC, it may, uh, it may compress the trachea sometimes and may cause a, a respiratory symptoms. So coming to the investigations, uh, the, uh, the most important primary investigation of the uh, for, for choice for these patients is the chest X-ray, which may give an approximate idea that whether the patient is having some lesion in the heart uh, or in the chest X-ray in the anterior mediastinum or not. So whenever the patient comes with uh, 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 dyspnea or a patient comes with stride or voiceness of voice or whatever it is, the first uh, modality of uh, investigation we will order is the chest X-ray. The chest X-ray, will give an idea of uh, 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 the uh, uh, homogeneous opacities in the uh, chest, which may give us a clue that uh, there is some mass effect is there. So uh, uh, you can see this X-ray, there is a small mass in, which is protruding into the right uh, thorax and compressing the right uh, uh, mainstem bronchi. And uh, the next uh, X-ray, this X-ray, the second X-ray on the right side is a large uh, retrosternal goiter pushing the trachea towards the right and the tracheal lumen is also narrowed. So this make, these things will give you a, a basic idea. 
so uh, about the anterior mediastinal mass and the position of the trachea and the position of the mediastinum all those things so uh, to uh, to investigate further so the uh, other investigation of choice is the computer tomography because this is one of the most important uh, 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 investigation where we can plan our anesthetic management so it will guide us like what kind of uh, uh, anesthesia plan we are going to give for this patient uh, whether plan a plan b plan c we have to keep in order based on the ct findings as well as the clinical symptoms as already told so coming to the ct uh, 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 imaging so it will give the anatomic detail of the mass the exact location and relationship to the adjacent structures any compressive effects on the uh, 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 any compressive effects on the airway or the cardiovascular involvement is there it will say but the most important disadvantage of this ct imaging is just a static image it may not it is not a dynamic image of the airways so uh, we can able to uh, see that we may not know the dynamic status of the airway for, for which uh, uh, this ct is not uh, very much uh, uh, useful for evaluating the dynamic uh, um, uh, airway uh, investigation so next comes the other investigations where the mri uh, is mainly done for the posterior mediastinal tumors and the vascular tumors uh, which are mostly soft tissue tumors and uh, the pulmonary function test the pulmonary function test previously uh, people used to recommend like uh, fixed obstruction or uh, it's a uh, uh, intrathoracic extra thoracic obstruction all those things but a uh, lot of uh, uh, studies have shown that the pulmonary function test is not a very reliable uh, 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 is not a variable testing for the predicting the intraoperative morbidity and mortality uh, but uh, they but studies have shown that uh, Uh, the reduction in peak expiratory flow rate during the pulmonary function test has shown to be uh, uh, post op uh, shown to in has shown to be uh, shown to be most reliable uh, 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 indicator for the post operative complications like post operative uh, airway obstruction post operative airway collapse all those things but intraoperatively uh, it, it was not uh, i mean a reliable uh, investigation for planning our anesthesia management and the next uh, this is uh, and the next is the uh, pet scans so these scans are mainly done by the uh, medical people to for staging and diagnosing and prognosis to predict the prognosis of the tumors and uh, it evaluates the metabolic activity of the tumor so that we can uh, reduce i mean give a medical therapy or chemotherapy the tumor size is very large we can give a medical therapy or a chemotherapy or radiotherapy uh, 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 to reduce the mass before uh, so that the uh, airway may open up so that it will be easy for us for the uh, perioperative anesthesia so other investigation is the transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography so this is usually done when the tumors uh, uh, causing some uh, 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 vascular obstructive signs and symptoms uh, so this is clear is a clear detail whether the tumor is in uh, causing encroachment or compression of the cardiac structures and uh, we can also able to position the patient and see whether uh, the compressive effect on the uh, vascular structures as a relieved uh, with the lateral position or sitting up position or whatever it is so it is a basic mainly for the tumors which are very adjacent to the cardiac structures as well as the great vessels so this is uh, these are the echo images of one of our patient which has been presented for a, 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 a pericardial mass uh, which is uh, uh, which is which is looks like to be a benign lipoma or something as uh doing the uh, intraoperative transesophageal echocardiography we found that the tumor was almost infiltrating and the right pulmonary artery the svc and the la as well as it also causing some compressive effect on the lva as well as in the posterior part of aorta so uh, after uh, uh, the, the, uh, although the ct and mri has showed that there was no much uh, vascular adherent and we found uh, uh, this uh, uh, thing that la is almost off compressed with the a masses and uh, so we opened the surgery and we did a partial resection of the tumor as most of the tumors were uh, very much adherent to the vascular structures like uh, uh, left atrium rpa and svc so we did a partial resection of the tumor and the patient has been uh, sent for uh, further uh, uh, further management either by radiotherapy or chemotherapy so other investigation of choice is the fiber optic uh, bronchoscopic examination to see the dynamic airway compression and also we can say with the positional this is one of the ex, uh, this is one of the fob in a child uh, uh, presenting with a severe left uh, uh, main stem bronchi uh, compression due to a uh, vascular mass like a, it's a dilated pulmonary artery which is compressing the uh, left side at uh, bronchus you can see that uh, this is this is this is a virtual and uh, is very much dynamic you can see the left bronchus which is completely occluded i can able to proceed further into the uh, left main stem bronchus now i am proceeding into the right main stem bronchus so we can able to see the uh, 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 secondary carina as well as the 
uh, right middle lobe and the lower lobe. This patient was not having a right upper lobe takeoff. Uh, the right upper lobe is, is, is taking out from the secondary carina. So in this uh, in this aspect, we can uh, we can uh, uh, you can directly evaluate the dynamic airway compression. And because whereas in the CT it will give you only static uh, 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 imaging, but dynamic uh, dynamic airway compression can be evaluated with the fiber optic bronchoscopy examination. But it is very uh, uh, it is very difficult to do in a, uh, a patient with having uh, symptoms of uh, uh, dyspnea and uh, uh, strider, all those things. But uh, it is uh, it is uh, described as one of the good investigation to evaluate the dynamic airway compression. So coming to the surgical approaches. So the patient has been presented and has been investigated and it was come out as a uh, anterior mediastinal mass and the patient has to be planned either for a therapeutic intervention or for a diagnostic intervention. So uh, for a diagnostic uh, uh, intervention, they may uh, surgeons may do a biopsy and send it for a HP examination. So the, for biopsy, they may uh, opt for a cervical mediastinoscopy or an anterior parastinal, parastinal mediastinoscopy or a mediastinotomy or a VATS biopsy. For a therapeutic, the therapeutic is they found it is a benign and it is uh, uh, and it is not involving much vascular structures and it can be easily removed. They may do an excision of the mediastinal mass as a, a treatment by through a, they can do it through a thoracotomy or a sternotomy. So coming to the part of our part like anesthesia, how to provide anesthesia for this uh, this uh, this high risk patients? Like first we have to risk stratify and find out that which patients is high risk patient, which patients is low risk patient. So for this, we need three important uh, uh, tools. We can say three important tools for uh, for risk stratification of these patients. The first one is the clinical signs and symptoms. So we have to evaluate the patient uh, uh, signs and symptoms, and we have to uh, uh, see them like whether uh, the symptoms will decrease when the patient uh, changes position or uh, the patient, uh, 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 how is the supine, if the uh, symptoms increase when the patient lies down, we have to ask for it. And also the radiological studies, the chest X-ray and CT to see the any airway compression. So uh, whether there is any deviation of trachea or any, any compression of the um, uh, um, uh, carina or the uh, uh, mainstem bronchi. And also the echocardiography to look for uh, any uh, compression of the cardiovascular structures and uh, any, any symptoms of uh, any pericardial effusion, all those things. So based on this, uh, uh, we, have to we are classifying the patient as high-risk criteria when the patient is having a dyspnea, that is orthopnea, when the patient lies supine, and there is increased cough when the patient is lying supine, that is supine symptoms. The patient is having supine symptoms as well as syncope, SVC syndrome, and pericardial effusion, and the tracheal compression on, this, on the chest X-ray or the CT. CT is the most diagnostic for evaluating the tracheal compression. If it is less than 50% of the predicted cross-sectional area, some people will take it as a diameter, whatever if it is less than 50%. Uh, and uh, compression is there. Uh, diameter is less than 50%, the compression is more than 50%. So then uh, we have to uh, classify uh, if the patient is having all these symptoms, we have to classify the, stratify this patient as a high risk criteria patient. So uh, whenever the patient comes with this high risk criteria, first we have to uh, talk with the surgeon and we have to formulate a plan. Uh, we may think that the mass effect is very much high so that it may not be able to intubate, or the patient may not be intubate, able to intubate. And uh, uh, if the patient, uh, having some uh, vascular compression, they may cause some uh, uh, reduction preload after induction of anesthesia. So all those things, uh, they, with the alternative uh, plan, we can go for, first we can admit the patient for a chemotherapy or a admi administration of steroids or the radiotherapy, so that uh, the size of the tumor a little bit, it may come down. And after that, once the tumor comes down, we have to evaluate for whether the supine symptoms has improved or not. Once it has improved, then we can and uh, take up the patient safely for a, uh, uh, surgery uh, uh, and uh, the other option is uh, that if the bronchus is very much uh, compressed or anything we may do a bronchial stenting uh, and do a flexible or rigid bronchoscopy after that to evaluate the air is open so that it will be easy for us uh, to provide anesthesia for these patients so uh, uh, we have to do a clinical risk grading before uh, uh, giving a, a general anesthesia for this patient. So, so the clinical risk grading uh, in uh, has been of uh, four grades. Like the first first grade, a subset of patients, uh, the patient may be asymptomatic, and uh, we can uh, say it as a mild risk when the patient can lie supine with some cough or pressure sensation, and there is a moderate risk when the patient can lie supine for short periods but cannot indefinitely. Uh, 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 patient has having a, a, a clinical risk grading of severe 
when the patient cannot tolerate any of the supine position. So through uh, by, uh, by this clinical risk grading, we may categorize the patient and categorize the anesthesia plan accordingly. So the stratification of GA so is low. Risk when the patient is an asymptomatic adult and the CT or a tracheal bronchial diameter is more than 50% of the predicted. And it is very high risk, as I already told, the patient is severely symptomatic, patient having supine symptoms when the patient lies down, a patient cannot able to lie down. So the patient is considered to be a high risk and the tracheal and the CT diameter is less than 50%. So it, children, it is less than 50%, whereas in adults, even though if it is less than, uh, it is uncertain, there is one more category of stratification is an uncertain or intermediate between the low and the high. If the patient is having a mild or moderate symptomatic adult, or a asymptomatic adult with a CT diameter less than a bronchial diameter less than 50%, or a mild or moderate symptomatic child with CT tracheal or bronchial diameter more than 50%, and an adult or a child who are not able to give a history. Whenever the patient cannot be able to give a proper history of supine symptoms, you have to categorize as an intermediate uh, group so that we can uh, uh, stratify these patients and plan our anesthesia accordingly. So coming to the pediatric patients, as we already told, the pediatric the intermediate mass never really, um, occur in pediatric patients also. So the issues in pediatric patients is although they have a compressive effects, they may have very, they are have, have very less cardiopulmonary reserve. They have more compressible cardiac structures of the airway. Even small mass of small uh, small amount also it may cause a significant airway obstruction in pediatric patients. And there is an underestimation of severity of airway compression due to unclear history of positional symptoms. And uh, securing the airway distal to the obstruction with the awake FOB is not possible. It means that uh, awake FOB guided intubation is, is very difficult in a pediatric patient. We may need a little bit of sedation even. The adult patients may cooperate for your awake FOB uh, intubation, but uh, in pediatric patients, it's very tough. So our main anesthetic concerns in these kind of patients is pre-medication is always a challenge. And because it may cause a respiratory depression, in patients, we have to evaluate properly whether the patient is having symptoms or not. And we may not know, like, if they pay, if you give a pre-medication with some benzodiazepines or, or uh, um, any uh, any other uh, uh, pre-medication, the patient may develop a respiratory depression, uh, and uh, because of the mass effect, and it may collapse the airways. And uh, the patient uh, uh, supine position, the may have a, a decreased thoracic volume by decreasing the cage dimensions and the cephalid shift of displacement of the diaphragm, and there is an increased blood flow to the muscles. So all these things are a challenge uh, in, in the perioperative period. So making the patient lying supine as well as giving perimedication to these patients is always a challenge. So uh, also the inhalational agents, if you want to give an inhalation of spontaneous agents, uh, uh, get it as spontaneous ventilation. And uh, there is a decrease in the muscle tone and the lung volumes. There will be a reduced peak expiratory flow rate and there is a cardiac depression and the venodilatation will be caused by the inhalational agents. So all these things may cause further uh, increase the burden on you apart from the anti-medicinal mass effects. So also the muscle relaxants, it may relax the diaphragm and move towards cephalad and there is a loss of negative intrapleural pressure and there's a tinting effect of the diaphragm. So all these things may cause a burden. So we have to little balance our anesthesia techniques and uh, 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 so that we can able to buy load from these kind of cases. So uh, regarding the anesthetic management in the high risk criteria patient, as I already told patient having supine symptoms and the uh, uh, tracheal diameter less than 50% uh, of the uh, predicted. So in these patients, we always uh, avoid a general anesthesia and uh, plan talk with the surgeons or uh, uh, the other team and uh, you have to plan for either a local or regional anesthesia and consider a rapid positioning change if needed. So we also uh, think about like if the patient after giving a mild sedation or anything or during the procedure, if the patient develops any symptoms of uh, airway compression like dyspnea strider, all those things, we should have a backup plan like they were can able to change the position of the uh, patient so that the patient uh, uh, may have, uh, will, will get relief symptoms. Also, a uh, few studies have recommended dexmedetomidin as a sedation in these kind of cases, which may maintain the uh, uh, respiration may not, may not have, cause much respiratory depression. So most important thing is that uh, not to touch the muscle relaxant in these high risk cases unless as a, as a, uh, you are very much uh, uh, confident that your tube is well placed and it may not cause any mass symptoms distal to the tube. And, uh, and always try to maintain a spontaneous respiration in these patients because whenever you may encounter difficulty, you can revert back and uh, and then you can awake the patient. So coming to the induction and intubation, 
the induction and intubation should be done in a step by step approach you should not rush like giving propofol fentanyl and relaxant and just you should not rush into it we should do a step by step approach for the induction and intubation verify adequate ventilation and circulation at each step you proceed at each step you have to just after giving some drug you have to wait and watch whether the patient is having adequate ventilation the pressures are okay the saturation is okay so you have to wait and watch for each and every step of the adequate ventilation and circulation and also use a short acting medications always because uh, it will be easy for you to revert when you are not able to uh, 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 proceed further so use a short acting medications and avoid the muscle relaxants if possible and uh, if in extreme cases if there is for surgical reasons if you need you can use choline and uh, you can uh, uh, easily uh, out of it when uh, when you want to revert back so the options for induction of anesthesia or so first one i say is don't give induction that is for high risk cases don't induce the patient try to do the case under local or regional anesthesia with or without sedation like if you want to do uh, a, a, a cervical mediastinoscopy or a, a, a cambleis procedure or whatever the biopsy biopsy procedures you try to do under local or regional anesthesia and uh, uh, second option is awake fob intubation uh, don't induce the patient just Uh, uh, anesthetize the airway and try to do an awake FOB intubation, but be clear that the ET tube should pass beyond the area of compression and place it beyond the area of compression, and we should make clear that there should not be any compression effects be, uh, beyond the tip of the endotracheal tube. After the placing the tube, you can proceed with induction. And the third is the maintenance of spontaneous ventilation. so this can be done with small boluses of iv anesthetic or inhalational anesthetics keep the patient under spontaneous ventilation and try to uh, intubate under spontaneous ventilation if possible and once the tube crosses the tip of the uh, crosses the uh, uh, compression area then you can start at, uh, uh, muscle relaxants if you want and standard iv induction these can be practiced in a very low risk patients where there is no mass effects on the trachea uh, and the history does not have any supine symptoms you can proceed with the standard iv induction and uh, uh, with or without muscle relaxants these should be practiced in a very low risk patients where there is no compressive effects on the airway as well as the uh, vascular structures so uh, just i will guide my entire uh, summary now like uh, through this flow chart like first of all you have to pre operatively you have to do a risk stratification and uh, based on the signs and symptoms as i told so pain symptoms dyspnea cough strider as well as the Uh, uh, vascular compressive symptoms and also the chest x-ray ct and echo and and we are uh, we are uh, uh, categorizing the patient into low risk high risk and the intermediate risk when for the high risk patients when for the low risk patients you can consider a standard iv induction with or without muscle relaxants i already told for the high risk patients we have to proceed in a very careful manner as i already told for high risk patients avoid uh, Right, uh, general anesthesia. Try to do a case with a local or regional anesthesia if feasible, because most of the high risk patients they may need a biopsy for categorizing, uh, staging the tumor or anything. And uh, uh, for uh, uh, after uh, if the regional anesthesia is feasible, you can do it. Always consider the preoperative treatment. As already told, do you go for, if you subject the patient to a medical therapy or radiotherapy or give some steroids or reduce the size of the tumor so that the compressive effects will be released and you can take the patient for a, a standard uh, in GA. so if gi is required we cannot able to do a uh, uh, do it under local or regional and cannot be uh, considered for a pre op treatment you can subject the patient for a, a ga uh, before that we have to make the patient put the patient under fem fem bypass uh, cardiopulmonary bypass or ecmo cannulation pre op and slowly uh, after taking the uh, once a cpb and ecmo takes care of the patient then you can start G, uh, induction of ga in these patients and uh, that is always high risk of airway obstruction in these kind of patients so always do an awake fob intubation and place the tube beyond the site of obstruction so all these uh, uh, steps has to be followed if you are dealing with an high risk patient now the point comes the intermediate or indeterminate risk so we we know these are the very critical uh, 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 patients because we may not know like uh, like how the patient will land up sometimes a, a patient will be very fine and we may not need any of sometimes the patient may crash us like anything after induction because uh, these group subject of patients is, is is always a difficult if there is high risk we will have a proper plan if it's a low risk we have a standard plan so if patient comes in this category then uh, it, it's always a little tough for us like anything can happen any time so you have to go with all the preparations for these patients so uh, there is although there is a low or intermediate risk of airway obstruction so always keep a spontaneous breathing technique in these patients because these patients we may not know like after giving in the induction drugs the patient may airway may collapse 
So always the advice is for these category of patients is to go for a spontaneous breathing technique and a semi folus position whenever the patient is not feeling comfortable or the symptoms of compression obstruction increases. Always avoid the muscle relaxant in these group of patients. So <clears throat> always give a small boluses, induce these patients with small boluses of, uh, uh, of uh, IV medications like propofol, etomidate, or if you want to use ketamine, you can use it. And uh, but uh, everything in being a uh, 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 small, small boluses you have to give. Otherwise, if you are comfortable with inhalation induction, you can use an inhalation induction very slowly. If IV boluses is not, you feel that is not adequate, then you go for an inhalational induction. So if none of the IV boluses are inhalation inductions, you may feel that during that time the airway is collapsing, or if you are not happy, then immediately subject the patient to a cardiopulmonary bypass or a ECMO. And but uh, it is a very, it is a very, I mean, like it cannot be, uh, so you cannot be, you cannot subject the patient immediately into a CBB or ECMO. It may need some time. So before that, you should maintain the spontaneous ventilation so that. Otherwise, uh, if the patient crashes, the, going into CPB and ECMO will take some 15, 20 minutes uh, if, if, they, if it is under the expert hands. Uh, so uh, till that time, you may have an anoxic brain injury or anything can happen. So always uh, be careful uh, when inducing these kind of subset of patients. And uh, so induction should be a stepwise induction after giving boluses if you feel that the patient is maintaining spontaneous breathing and there is no need for uh, or any portional change or anything. And uh, you can uh, do an awake intubation with this patient in the spontaneous ventilation without muscle relaxants. And uh, if, if there is an issue with the uh, after induction or intubation, you can immediately make, make sure that the patient can be uh, uh, made to uh, upright. If the patient can be made from upright to a supine position or supine to upright, so that it, which can change the patient uh, mass effects. We are ready to do that. And uh, and uh, so once everything is fine, there is no other issues then. You can proceed to, from the spontaneous ventilation to a positive pressure ventilation by giving some muscle relaxants. So this is the step-by-step -step approach of these patients. So these patients, the intermediate or the indeterminate, uh, having in, intermediate or indeterminate risk, these patients are more uh, difficult to manage because uh, although they clinically they may look better and extra-wise they may look better, once after the induction, they may crash like anything. So in any of these stages, if you feel any difficulty, revert to the prior stage of maintaining the spontaneous ventilation. And, and if there is a need and you can you have to intubate distal to the stenosis and uh, one most important thing is that we should have a bronchoscopist, a uh, good bronchoscopist nearby. So do, do a rigid bronchoscopy immediately and lift the mass up and uh, you can ventilate jet ventilation through the bronchoscope you can do. So if none of this works and if you are feeling uh, any issues, uh, you cannot able to revert to prior stage and, and uh, intubate. Uh, uh, and you cannot be able to do a rigid bronchoscopy. And the next thing is that you have to go for a uh, cardiopulmonary bypass or the ECMO in these patients. Or immediately you have to ask the surgeon to wash and do a sternotomy or thoracotomy to lift the mass up. So these are the uh, uh, options which has been available for the patients with the intermediate or indeterminate risk. So coming to the rescue strategy, uh, uh, the airway and hemodynamics. Like So we have to prepare whenever you go for an anti-medicinal case. So you have to uh, 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 you have to think about two things. One is the airway and one is the hemodynamics. So for airway, you have to keep all the tubes as well as the bronchoscopes ready and an experienced bronchoscopist ready whenever we need a difficulty in securing an airway. And for the hemodynamics, whenever you may feel like the patient is not able to coping up with the uh, pressures or perfusion or uh, anything, immediately the things should be available like cardiopulmonary bypass machine the ECMO machine and the ECMO circuits and the surgeon should be very much aware before induction of the patient, the patient, before induction of the patient, the surgeons should be available in the OR and the perfusion team should be ready. So coming to the standard monitoring in these patients, apart from the standard ASA monitors, we will uh, we always use an invasive arterial line and the central venous axis as in these patients and a transesophageal echocardiography there if, 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 he, if, he, uh, if he come to know through the uh, uh, pre-op imaging, there is an involvement of vascular structures. We always put a T probe in these subset of patients. For uh, if the patient is having an upper limb uh, uh, SVC obstruction or mass effect uh, near the SVC or something, we will go for the lower limb venous axis because whatever you give, it may not going to reach the patient if if the if the line is in the uh, upper limb or in the IJB, whatever it is. So coming to the transesophageal echocardiography, is it ten tool because most of the centers they may not have a, a T uh, machine, T probes. So, uh, uh, but in these high-risk high, in, high risk cases where they are having a, a chances of airway compression or the vascular structure compressions, uh, that the T is much more useful 
to uh, help us to uh, see the real time imaging of the heart as well as assess the contractility of the heart and there is any issues with the uh, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction or pulmonary artery obstruction also to assess the volume status of the patient because if there is some vascular structures there will be a lot of volume loss and we may not know whether the heart is filled up or not so with the te we can able to uh, assess all these uh, things which may be helpful and it is a asa and uh, uh, cs society of cardiac anesthesia and asa recommendation for uh, for uh, for use of uh, te probe for a known or suspected cardiovascular pathology which is resulting in an and a hemodynamic pulmonary or neurologic compromise and causing an unexplained persistent hypotension or unexplained hypoxemia during the surgery if we need that we have to just rotate the t probe and see like what is happening with the heart and uh, next the uh, emergence and the post operative care so as soon as the surgery is over the most of the major complications may occur occur in the post operative period so these patients may need a vigilance post operative monitoring the post operative issues may occur because we are trans making the patient transition from anesthesia to the awake state and there is a, always a compromised airway so uh, you should avoid pain anxiety and cough because it may uh, cause further uh, uh, issues in the compromised airway it may cause further increase in breathing and increase air flow already there is an airway collapse so there is a partial there is a turbulent flow inside the airway and uh, if there is a partial sedation is there which may cause an upper airway obstruction and may further increase the negative pressure and might cause the increased airway collapse also these patients have may prolonged massage for more than and 10 15 years these patients may have a compressive effects on the trachea and may result in tracheomalacia so this uh, the extubation should be properly planned and uh, suspecting these patients to have a tracheomalacia and intraoperatively you have to ask the surgeon after excision of the masses whether the tracheal consistency is good whether it is very much soft or anything and obviously you all know that post operatively you can do a caplic test uh, to find out the patient is having a tracheomalacia or not so plan it accordingly so if the patient is having a tracheomalacia if you feel and uh, once you take out the tube definitely it's going in, into a catastrophe so uh, we have to search for other options like can do a tracheal stenting or electively we can do a tracheal stenting for these kind of patients and uh, next thing is the uh, uh, airway edema so this svc obstruction long standing svc obstruction once you remove the tumor there may be some venous congestion of the airways and may result in airway edema so you should be very careful you should do a laryngoscopy before extubation and make sure that uh, the airway is full of and it's not of any edema or anything it is good and then everything is fine then you have to uh, plan for a uh, extubation in these kind of patients so uh, next the most important uh, syndrome which has been described is the mediastinal mass syndrome it is nothing but the clinical presentation of a mediastinal mass in anesthetized patients so as i already discussed and told about this like it may result in a respiratory decompensation and a hemodynamic decompensation so the respiratory Uh, decompression occurs due to an uh, airway compression it is nothing but the mechanical compression of the trachea the main bronchi by the tumors as well as uh, uh, the patient can be asymptomatic and develop during anesthesia as i already told this may become the intermediate group of patients where uh, uh, they may have not have any symptoms but once as we give uh, induce anesthesia it may produce a sudden mass effect on the trachea and the bronchi so it can occur in spontaneous ventilation also uh and uh, the pre operative ct is more predictable as i already told you have to see the tracheal and bronchial diameters and you have to make sure that whether this patient may develop airway compression after induction of anesthesia or not and uh, you are, should always keep a backup of uh, reinforced tubes and the long endobronchial tubes because if the lower end of trachea is uh, compressed or the right bronchus is compressed we can just put the tube and advance into the left bronchus or anything so you have to have a long endobronchial tubes and a flexible fob and a rigid bronchus should always be kept available in the ward when you are dealing with these kind of patients and uh, uh, so these patients may have a partial airway obstruction so if you ventilate the patients may develop a dynamic hyperinflation of the lungs so in these patients you should avoid peep to build up uh, uh, hyperinflation of the lungs so zero peep is uh, end expiratory pressure is recommended in these patients if you suspect there is a dynamic hyperinflation due to a partial airway obstruction so coming to the rescue options for airway obstruction so always keep uh, the dlts or the long endobronchial tubes and uh, advance it beyond the area of compression and reposition the patient to the patient of comfort if the patient is on spontaneous ventilation during uh, uh, and just an uh, induction of anesthesia you can place the patient if if not possible if not known a patient uh, because these patients may be asymptomatic suddenly if the patient uh, uh, develops a, compro- a compromised uh, airway then you have to make the patient to lateral or prone position whatever like so that uh, uh, the patient will be uh, 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 a relief of the compressive symptoms 
and uh, as i already told like assumption of the previous tolerated state like spontaneous ventilation and awake from anesthetic you have to revert back when you are whenever you are feeling that that it is not going uh, the steps are not going in a proper way so you can revert to the previous step and awake the patient or you can make the patient spontaneous ventilation and reduce the anesthetic depth and also uh, the rigid bronchoscopy should be done beyond the stenosis just to uh, say rescue therapy to put the bronchoscope and just open up the airway and you can and, and just uh, uh, reduce the mass effects and the last uh, key thing is that i already told that the cardiopulmonary bypass of the ecmo when the patient crashes and nothing and uh, nothing other options uh, helps you out and com- uh, coming the other other part of the mediastinal mass syndrome is the cardiovascular compression so it may occur as an svc compression and obstruction so it may during the surgery it may cause an excessive bleeding and uh, as i already told insufficient drug delivery if you have the lines in the upper limb or the neck and uh, possible airway swelling due to the uh, as i already told due to the venous edema of the vocal cords and the upper airway and also the compression of the pulmonary trunk so it may cause a, 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 a rot obstruction and hypoxemia because of the reduced blood flow to the lungs uh, resulting in uh, hypoxemia hypotension and even cardiac arrest so management of svc syndrome if you are feeling the patient is having an svc syndrome and you are taking up the uh, uh, patient for a, a surgery and uh, you should uh, always uh, should always uh, go up with the augmentation of the preload and you should position the patient to in such a way that it will cause less compressive effect on the heart of the major vessels and uh, always take a lower extremity iv access and uh, spontaneous ventilation should be maintained so that it will augment the venous return and uh, if 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 there is a sudden decompression or a sudden and uh, return uh, return of ven- venous return is reduced then you have to do a sternotomy and lift the mass to relieve the compression for this the surgeon should be always ready in, du- in inducing these kind of patients and next the role of uh, extracorporeal circulation it is mostly uh, uh, needed in uh, high risk patients and uh, there should be a pre induction femoral femoral cpb or a ecmo should be planned you should not think that after induction we may put the patient if anything happens we may put a patients on femoral femoral cpb or ecmo because you will not have time and positioning these patients is little uh, tough when when the uh, uh, when the patient crashes so uh, so uh, first uh, you have to do it under an awake state with the uh, local anesthesia and uh, the risk of uh, anticoagulation is always there because there may be some bleeding may be more and uh, there is a risk of anticoagulation is always there and the supine position for awake cannulation is little it's a little tough because these patient cannot able to lie supine and they may develop symptoms these are the challenges uh, in uh, getting in, in getting the patient for a, 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 a awake fem fem bypass or a ecmo so there is a more morbidity during emergency rescue so you always uh, uh, plan uh, and during pre induction so uh, next a sm- small thing about the media stenoscopy uh, how to provide anesthesia usually the media stenoscopy is usually done for a staging of the lung cancers or media stenal mass or biopsy or for the lymph node evaluation so it can be done under cervical or anterior media stenoscopy so it can be done under either a ga or a, a local anesthesia but all the things what we followed for uh, excision of the mask rest or not an intracotomy should be followed here the risking the clinical risk stratification as well as the pathway to be followed for induction so uh, the most important part is that the media stenoscope which is going through a small hole either in the uh, suprasternal notch or in the uh, uh, anterior uh, anterior part of the thoracic cavity uh, so this is a scope which which may cause the compressive effects on the innominate artery as well as the surrounding structures you see in this diagram the scope is flying uh, going be- behind the uh, right innominate artery and the adjacent structures were the pulmonary artery and the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the vesicular vein as well as posteriorly it is uh, the trachea is lying so there may be some compressive effects because of the media stenoscope as well as the uh, uh, mass so uh, so is always uh, recommended to have a right upper limb saturation if you are going for a media stenoscopy if there is any compression of the uh innominate artery so there will be a decrease in perfusion of the right upper limb and also the pressures may go down so either you can put an uh, uh, iv uh, sorry arterial line or a, a saturation probe on the right uh, and the right hand is recommended also uh, there may be a mass if the mass hemorrhage happens there is nothing to bail out in these patients you have to immediately uh, blood will be poured out and you have to uh, doing a sternotomy in this kind of major hemorrhagic uh, uh, situation is very difficult so always use a lower limb iv and massive transfusion protocol should be kept ready because although this looks like a simple scopy 
but once the uh, catastrophe happens then you may not be uh, 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 you may not be uh, get any helping hands to help you out so uh, there may be some chances of chemotherapy because and uh, it should be uh, ruled out it may cause some uh, uh, hypotension and, and hypoxemia and there may be chances to the injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve and vagus nerve and thoracic that and there is also maybe compression of aorta maybe the so now i will uh, uh, discuss about few clinical cases like like and see how the uh, pre operative uh, imaging and uh, history helped us uh, in uh, 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 managing these kind of patients the so case number 1 is a 9 years old male child with a complaint of uh, 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 recurrent cough with no uh, supine symptoms so the patient presented in the opd and he was investigated and this was his chest x ray uh, which was showing uh, uh, some homogeneous opacity in the uh, right side uh, uh, hemithorax which is co- which is covering almost a two third of the right thoracic cavity so this patient was subjected for a ct scan where you can find a, a mass which is lying adjacent to the heart uh, occupying the uh, almost uh, say to two third of the thoracic cavity and uh, so this patient was planned for a excision of the mass and it was found uh, it was given as a benign mass and the patient was not having uh, any supine symptoms and uh, the airway was not much compressed uh, uh, as you see in the x ray you can able to till trachea you can able to uh, the trachea is uh, clear and patent there was no compression and the tracheal bifurcation is also uh, good so so we planned for a, a excision of this mass through a right thoracotomy so we put a a uh, 6 mm endotracheal tube and a 7 french horn bronchial blocker and we went in for a one lung ventilation and uh, uh, with the left lung and uh, the mass was excised this was the right thoracotomy and uh, this was the excision of the mass this was the mass size which was occupying is <coughs> sorry right side of thoracic cavity this was the deflated lung this was the deflated lung which was lying here and uh, the mass was excised out and the patient has been uh, a postoperative was uh, postoperative bed was uneventful and the patient was discharged home and uh, a second case was a 37 years old male uh, who was presented with a dyspnea on excision but there was no supine symptoms so he was evaluated and with chest x ray is a primary modality as i told the chest x ray was taken and he was found to have a, la- a la- homogeneous opacity on the right side of the thoracic uh, cavity similar to the previous case and uh, the trachea if you see that uh, the trachea and the bifurcation we can able to Uh, uh uh make out here there was no obstruction or deviation of the trachea as well as uh, the left bronchi the right bronchus is not seen properly although so so the patient uh, uh, left dlt was inserted and the patient underwent mass excision with a right thoracotomy so uh, this patient uh, the mass was very much adherent to the uh, uh, pericardium because the pericardium is the post like me posteriorly so uh, so a part of the a part of this was the pericardium of the heart a part of the pericardium is removed along with the mass and uh, we repaired the a, a pericardial cavity with a, a patch so that we closed the pericardial cavity with a patch so the right thoracotomy and this is the uh, i think it is a, a mediastinal teratoma this case, which is have, which is uh, just uh, getting infiltrated with the uh, pericardium of the heart so it was removed and it was repaired with the pericardial patch so the other case is a 8 years old male child with a recurrent history of cough and uh, and uh, he was presented with a recurrent history of cough and uh, respiratory tract infections otherwise the child is not having any supine spin symptoms or anything the immediate an x-ray was taken which was this is the left side is the x-ray you can see that only a small portion of the right lung is seen there was a huge mass like like a white out thing filling at the entire part of the uh, uh, left uh, hemithorax as well as the part of the mediastinum middle mediastinum as well as the part of the right thoracic cavity so the ct imaging was done and it was found that uh, it was a huge mass which was sitting in the uh, uh, mediastinum and it was uh, overlying the this is the pulmonary this is the division of the pulmonary artery this is the trachea a uh, lower end of trachea and this is the esophagus but uh, in the x ray you see that there was no much deviation and the trachea looks patterned so you can see this is a ct image you can see the mass which is huge enough and it is lying in anterior to the heart and almost occupying the left side at full thoracic cavity so if you see here the airway also looks bad and the tracheal bifurcation everything was okay and the patient was not having any supine symptoms or anything so this is a cross section where you can see the trachea if you follow the trachea there was no compression here 
and the bifurcation is also good. So there was no compressive or mass effect on these things. But if you see the mass, it is it is occupying almost it's a huge mass. It is occupying almost the left-sided thoracic cavity, and compressing the lungs and almost extending anteriorly and going towards the right. So the patient was, uh, because we, we consider this patient as a low risk patient and we did give a, a standard induction and uh, we interpreted with a six millimeter endotracheal tube. And uh, just after the sternotomy, the mass pops up and uh, it was the full huge mass which we resected out. And uh, this was a mass, which was very huge. And uh, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a thymic lipoma, which is a very benign tumor, and it was taken out. So this was the X-ray, post-operative X-ray. The pre-operative X-ray, you see that huge mass, and this is the post-operative X-ray, where you can see the clear lung shadows as well as the cardiac shadows. And the patient, uh, post-operative course was uneventful, and the patient was discharged home. And uh, the next case is a two-year-old male child with current, uh, current cough and wheeze and positional dyspnea and cough versus compliance. He sleeps more comfortably in right lateral position. There is history of noisy breathing during bouts of respiratory tract infection. So this was his chest X-ray. Having a, in this, there was a mass seeing occupying the right thoracic cavity, and the, if you see the trachea, the tracheal uh, position is normal. There was no deviation, and the uh, 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 bronchi was left bronchi was patterned. So if this was the carinal level where there is no compression or anything, and the mask is occupying the anterior part of the mediastinum. So there was uh, the, the, the trachea looks patent in, in all the sections and uh, there was no compression. So we, we did an excision of mass through a, uh, uh, through the, uh, through a uh, standard uh, uh, endotracheal tube and uh, the mass was excised. Uh, we, there's a note for, uh, we went for a, we plan for a one lung ventilation, but we can't able to do so. So we just put the tube and uh, the thoracotomy was done and the lung was retracted a little bit and we went with low tidal volume and we just excised the mass. And the next case is a 30 years old male who had a progressive worsening dyspnea and uh, symptoms of inability to lie fat. There was no worsening or relief of symptoms in the lateral position, uh, although there was a mild strider. So this patient was evaluated. Uh, the chest X-ray showed a huge mass on the uh, right hemithorax, and uh, there is a uh, uh, the carina and the right and left bronchi were displaced left and downwards, and the diameter of the bronchi and the trachea is also very much narrow. This is a CT section showing the trachea, the anterior the trachea and posterior esophagus, which is very narrow, and uh, you can see the arch vessels lying around the mass, and also the trachea is pushed towards the uh, uh, left side. This is left side, and this is the right side. This is the mass, and the trachea is pushed towards the left side and below is the use of figures. And in the lower diagram, you can see that uh, the trachea is compressed and displaced to the left side. And, uh, and that, this is the minimal tracheal diameter we can able to manage below. And uh, the left pulmonary artery is, uh, the right pulmonary artery is very much compressed by the mass and the tracheal uh, bifurcation is, looks okay at the lower end. So you can see the patient was subject to MRI for another reason to evaluate the mass. Uh, in that also, we can able to find the uh, in the trachea, which is displaced anteriorly and towards the left, and it is compressed. So uh, this patient was uh, subjected to... Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Dr. Saravanak Babu, it is yeah. here exceeding too much time. I think another two yeah. speakers, can you... Can you uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a major RV, uh, coming to the summary of my presentation, there's a major RV and cardiovascular compression under GA, which could be fatal. And there is always a high risk features like supine symptoms, SVC syndrome, pericardial effusion, evidence of airway or cardiovascular compression on CT imaging. So imaging, anatomical location of the mass as well as its relationship to vital structures can be uh, ruled uh, can be uh, can be ruled out with the imaging. And uh, uh, whenever the diagnostic procedure is planned, always plan under GA. Uh, sorry, local anesthesia whenever feasible. Uh, when you're going for a therapeutic intervention, plan for a general anesthesia. And uh, the induction of general anesthesia should be in a face patient, as I already told, and the planned airway management techniques should be in your hand. And the perioperative planning with the surgical team is most important. You talk with the surgeon and just you tell your plans and just, uh, uh, the, and you also know their plans and, and your uh, management plans for the potential acute airway obstruction or cardiovascular collapse, you just discuss with them and pre-induction CPB or ECMO cannulation should be considered in extremely high risk patients. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity, Dr. Meenakshi Shandaram. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Saranarabhi. It is a very 
elaborate and excellent talk you covered you covered from the start of uh, anatomy of mediastinum to the level of anesthetic management and then about the case presentations it is it's a very good talk the most important thing everyone should keep in mind is other than the clinical risk uh, grading you should always do that uh, stratification of risk for general anesthesia either as low risk or intermediate risk or high risk from that level you can go on he has elaborated about how to go about low risk and high risk and intermediate risk is one that uh, the most difficult thing when to go for another modality is a difficult thing for intermediate risk so those things also the options he has clearly conveyed uh, there are much not much uh, questions can we have a discussion at the end or we'll go ahead sir elm sir Yeah, sir is not there it very sami sir sir at the end at the end at the end okay 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 we'll move on to the next talk thank you dr sarun babu thank you very much sir the next talk uh, the next talk will be on uh, anesthetic management of carotid endarterectomy uh, that is by uh, dr don jos uh, he is an assistant professor at uh, sigitra so carotid endarterectomy obviously everybody knows that uh, there is a proven uh, stenosis beyond that uh, the pre op uh, assessment as well as the uh, neuro monitoring device is used uh, heparin reversal and post operative hypertension hyperperfusion syndrome all those things he will elaborately cover uh, with this few uh, introduction i invite uh, dr jafar sorry dr dan jos to proceed for anesthetic management of carotid endarterectomy over to dr john good evening sir uh, yeah. am i audible sir yeah well audible please uh, go ahead thank you for opportunity sir for providing uh, me a chance uh, to present in front of all uh, thank you very much sir i'll be going straight away for the uh, discussion sir um so as we know that the stroke is a leading cause of disability in the developed world and uh, it can be because of the ischemic as well as the hemorrhagic so ischemic stroke contributes about to 80% of the stroke and hemorrhagic stroke is about 20% of the ischemic stroke uh, extracranial atherosclerosis intracranial atherosclerosis lacunar and cardioembolic stroke are uh, um, uh, are the causes of the ischemic uh, stroke and uh, sometimes we do have cryptogenic stroke also in the form of uh, pfos patent uh, for amen oval so that comes under the cryptogenic stroke uh, because uh, around 25% of the population is having pfo so coming to the uh, carotid artery stenosis it comes under the extracranial atherosclerosis as uh, and it contributes to about 15 to 20% of the acute ischemic stroke so what are the risk factors for the stroke so risk factors for the stroke as well as for the atherosclerosis uh, of the carotid artery is almost the same so it is hypertension uncontrolled diabetes smoking heart disease hyperlipidemia uh, any previous tia or a minor stroke and homocysteinemia so what is carotid uh, artery stenosis so carotid artery stenosis is the stenosis of the proximal ica bifurcation uh, ica or the bifurcation of the common carotid artery so it is mainly because of the deposition of erythema uh, atheroma in the uh, uh, leading to this uh, or the carotid sclerosis uh, causing this uh, carotid artery stenosis so now this is a major uh, uh, risk for uh, causation of uh, the tia or the minor stroke and uh, once when the patient develops tia or the minor stroke the patient can uh, uh, can suffer a major stroke later on uh, in the first uh, few days after the primary event so hence carotid revascularization is uh, performed to reduce the risk in order to decrease the uh, fatal or the disabling stroke so usually this uh, revascularization uh, is uh, done within 2 weeks uh, because the burden of the stroke uh, increases as the day progresses by from the minor event or the tia so hence uh, the patient can go for the carotid uh, stenting or for uh, car carotid endarterectomy so the coming to the pathophysiology why is this stenosis more common at the carotid bulb so as you can see uh, that this is a common carotid and uh, this is a common carotid and where it is bifurcating into the ica and the external carotid artery so here you can see this is a carotid bulb so as the 
uh, as the uh, as there's a change in the diameter actually from the common carotid it, uh, and uh, and to the bifurcation. So this change in the uh, chain, diameter can lead to the local flow reversal, or else there can be a low shear stress and a flow stagnation. So as you can see in this. Uh, In this uh, figure here, uh, this is actually a, a Doppler ultrasound, which has been a uh, follow flow Doppler, which has been uh, placed across the carotid artery. So you can see uh, the red flow indicates that the flow is towards the transducer, but here the blue indicates the flow away from the transducer. So you can see that there is a flow reversal over here at the bifurcation. So this is leads to the common site of carotid atheroma. So what is uh, carotid endarterectomy? So uh, carotid endarterectomy, it was first performed by Debeck in 1953. So it involves the exposure and the cross clamping of the carotid artery above and below the area of stenosis. So this is the area of stenosis where an incision is made above and below and it, uh, uh, the atheroma is removed. So the atheroma within the artery is removed usually via longitudinal incision and the defect is closed by primary closure or using a patch angioplasty. So you can use a synthetic or an autologous vein grafts. Usually uh, in our institute, we, we use the saphenous venous graft. So what are the indications for carotid endarterectomy? So uh, in symptomatic patients, uh, having uh, carotid artery stenosis of more than 70%, or else in asymptomatic patients uh, with a carotid uh, uh, artery stenosis is more than 60%, uh, with a patient who is having a surgical risk of less than 3%. Now, surgical risk means uh, stroke, MI or death. And at least a life expectancy of 5 years. Um, then in asymptomatic patients, uh, carotid artery stenosis of more than 75% uh, in patients with a surgical risk of 3 to uh, 5%. And uh, if a patient is having uh, carotid artery stenosis of more than 70% and the patient is having coronary artery disease and undergoing a CABG procedure. So these are the indications for CA. Now, there are various recommendations from uh, different uh, institutions like AHA and ASA. They recommend for uh, symptomatic more than 70%. But um, uh, the SVS, that is a Society of Vascular Surgeons, they recommend uh, a symptomatic patient where the carotid artery stenosis is more than 60%. Then um, there is actually a debate between whether to go for carotid endarterectomy or whether to go for a carotid artery stenting. So usually uh, for a symptomatic patient of more than 70 uh, 70% 70 uh, either carotid endarterectomy or carotid artery stenosis uh, uh, the patient can undergo but uh, carotid artery stenosis is more preferred when the patient is having other high risk comorbidities like for example coronary artery disease when the patient uh, uh, is not fit for or uh, for carotid um, uh, art, uh, endarterectomy so such patients can go for carotid artery stenting and uh, uh, but uh, the society of uh, vascular surgery uh, they don't recommend carotid artery stenting uh, uh, usually uh, and especially for asymptomatic patients they are totally uh, it is it is uh, they say that it is a class it is a it's a class 3 recommendation that is uh, it is totally harmful so what is followed in our institute is that symptomatic patients of more than 50% and uh, in asymptomatic patients, we do carotid uh, uh, endarterectomy, uh, especially when the uh, plaque is vulnerable, if there's a contralateral occlusion, if the stenosis is more than 80%, and if there's a silent impact on CT or evidence of embolism via transcranial do Doppler. Now, such patients are never, uh, are never asymptomatic. They'll be having some evidence of uh, neurological deficient, and such patients we do take up for the surgery. So what are the contraindications for carotid endarterectomy? So we have both the anatomical factors as well as the patient-related factors. Now the anatomical factors includes uh, if, the, uh, if there is a high carotid bifurcation, uh, there's, that is uh, extension of the incision uh, uh, towards the root of the neck will be difficult. Uh, secondly, uh, opening up of the vessel and uh, removal of the uh, plaque is also going to be tedious. So therefore, in such patients, we do avoid. Then very low uh, carotid bifurcation is that it will be at the level of the root of the neck. So there also it is going to be difficult uh, because uh, sometimes if it is on the left side, the left pleura and all can be involved. Uh, so uh, leading to a pneumothorax. So hence, we avoid in such patients. Then any history of uh, previous uh, neck irradiation or a uh, previous neck surgery, for example, radical neck dissection. 
so uh, it, uh, lot of additions and all uh, will develop so therefore it is very difficult uh, to get an access uh, to the artery and the presence of a uh, tracheostomy tube is always an impediment for uh, carotid artery stenosis and uh, patient who develops uh, restenosis uh, after the initial carotid uh, endarterectomy so these are the anatomical factors and coming to the uh, patient related factors especially the high risk uh, cardiac surgery patient patient with severe lv dysfunction uh, with uh, um, uh, triple uh, severe triple vessel disease or associated peripheral vascular disease uh, in such patients uh, it is uh, uh, they are often defined as a high risk cardiac patients and secondly a patient who has suffered a major stroke and a patient with altered sensorium where there is uh, no chance of recovery or slight only, only a minimal chance of recovery and such patients will go into uh, tracheostomy so such patients we do avoid so it is contraindicated ca so what is the timing of intervention so the uh, the best timing is uh, within 2 weeks and uh, the society of vascular uh, uh, surgeons they say that aggressive therapy can be given and that is within 48 hours uh, for a symptomatic patient now this is because uh, recurrent stroke uh, have an appro uh, uh, can have an approach of 7% in about 2 days and uh, and 10% within 7 days of the initial event so hence they say that we have to do a aggressive management and uh, uh, patients who are medically stable and those who are having relatively smaller impacts on the imaging studies uh, it is reasonable to perform early interventions uh, within 48 hours after the stroke so provided there is no hemorrhagic infarct or a dense stroke or uh, two thirds of the mca territory is not involved so um, so uh, these are the uh, usual timings which we do consider in our institute and uh, a patient is defined as uh, asymptomatic after the event is uh, only after 6 months so now coming to the uh, pre operative evaluation for uh, carotid endarterectomy so carotid endarterectomy is defined as an intermediate risk surgery and the patient may present with uh, uh, if it uh, uh, with brui with a carotid brui or with a tra uh, or with a uh, tia or with amaurosis uh, frogax where so there will be sudden loss of vision or dizziness weakness hemiparesis or hemiplegia now usually uh, they are the elderly age group people so therefore they are prone to have the comorbidities like un, uh, hypertension such patients are always uncon they do have uncontrolled hypertension or some accelerated hypertension which later on precipitates uh, the event or else they'll be un, uh, uncontrolled diabetic uh, then hyperlipidemia smoking history will be there coronary artery disease peripheral vascular disease copd uh, then uh, of course a patient would already be a stroke patient and uh, uh, they may be having cervical spondylosis uh, issues so therefore airway uh, difficulty and positioning difficulty may also be present so pre operative optimization is the norm actually but uh, we sometimes we may not have time because we have to take up the uh, patient um, uh, immediate uh, like within 48 hours after the stroke so we may not have time for pre optimization so what are the investigation so the lab investigation which includes a complete blood count Uh, then uh, 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 complete urine examination and ecg echo chest x ray blood sugar abg abg is for the baseline psa2s because these are elderly patients and so therefore uh, uh, the psa2s will be on the higher range and we have to know the psa2 also this is because uh, the cerebral physiology is always uh, psa2 dependent so if the uh, usually uh, such patients can have a chronic uh, um, hypercarbia so during time of induction if we try to decrease the um, psa2 level so therefore uh, will be causing vasoconstriction actually so we may try to bring down the psa2 to normocapnia uh, but the problem will be that we will cause uh, cerebral vasoconstriction and therefore uh, uh, it may further aggravate the ischemia then um, uh, uh, patient is also subjected to brain uh, brain, uh, brain imaging in the form of ct or mri and especially uh, stroke protocol is followed in a stroke patient and whereas uh, uh, carotid image uh, imaging is also done carotid imaging in the form of uh, doppler ultrasound ct angio or mr angio and uh, patients with a history of coronary artery disease we can do uh, coronary angiogram and simultaneously do a carotid uh, angio so here this table shows the uh, doppler ultrasound which we commonly do in our institute 
so like uh, the stenosis can be graded into mild, moderate and severe. Uh, uh, mild disease is less than 50% uh, of the stenosis. Moderate is uh, 50 to 70% and the severe disease is uh, more than 70%. So these are the velocities uh, which you can uh, determine it uh, and we can uh, uh, determine the degree of stenosis uh, non-invasively. So coming to the um, uh, pre uh, optimization, it would, uh, it would be ideal to reduce the cardiovascular risk factors. Now, uh, so the cardiovascular risk factors would, uh, would be like a cessation of the smoking, control of uh, the hyperlipidemia. So we can start uh, statins. Uh, patient can be started on uh, dual antiplatelets or uh, simply on, uh, on ecosprin also. Then uh, patient will be usually hypertensive. So therefore, um, antihypertensive medications uh, to be started. And uh, uh, patient will also be diabetic. So therefore, uh, control of the uh, uh, blood sugar is also very important. And uh, if possible, uh, if, uh, if we are uh, prolonging the surgery, we can ask for lifestyle modification changes also. A reduction of the weight. So something like this we can um, uh, 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 do for the patient before the patient is subjected for the surgery. Then uh, anti-thrombotic uh, therapy is also very important. So some centers this do start uh, dual antiplatelets, um, but um, a study says that uh, echo, uh, uh, aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid would be enough. Um, uh, but if the patient is uh, continued on a dual antiplatelet therapy, post-operative period also he has to be continued on the uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. So usually in our uh, institute, uh, we do have a, a, a neurophysician opinion before we take up. So based on their uh, decision, uh, we follow the pre-medications. And um, as usual, uh, continue all the long-term uh, medications and uh, um, and uh, dual antiplatelets, especially cl clopilet, uh, should be stopped five days before the surgery, but aspirin can be continued, low-dose aspirin, 75 mg. Uh, before I uh, go into the anesthesia details, I just want to show you about the circular villus. So the why, why this is very important is uh, because uh, intraoperatively we have to maintain a contralateral circulation whenever the ipsilateral uh, vessel is blocked. So therefore, uh, as we know that uh, the major supply to the brain comes from the internal carotid artery uh, as well as from the vertebral artery. Uh, the internal carotid artery divides into the middle cerebral artery as well as the anterior cerebral artery. Uh, the two anterior cerebral arteries uh, uh, is uh, connected by the anterior communicating artery. And uh, whereas the vertebral artery, they unite to form the basilar artery and uh, they, give, they form the posterior cerebral artery. Uh, and uh, they are connected to the anterior uh, circulation and the middle circulation by the posterior communicating artery. So here, the importance of uh, contralateral circulation is very important because we measure sometimes the stump pressure. So whenever the ipsilateral artery is uh, clamped, the IC is clamped, so there is no blood flow to the uh, brain. So it is the uh, contralateral flow uh, uh, gives the blood flow to that ischemic part of the brain. So uh, I'll be coming with the uh, about the detail of the stump pressure in the coming slides. So what is the anesthesia uh, management? So it includes the standard ASA monitoring, uh, that is the ECG, pulse oximetry, uh, tem uh, temperature monitoring, uh, especially coming to the ECG, the lead two and the uh, lead V5 monitoring is very important uh, with ST analysis. And arterial line, usually the ipsilateral um, upper limb artery is uh, cannulated. This is because, uh, for example, if you are uh, 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 doing a surgery of the right carotid artery, then I prefer the right uh, up, um, uh, radial artery or the ulnar artery to be cannulated. Uh, especially uh, this comes at a time of clamping or um, and the placement of the shunts, where sometimes uh, uh, the shunt may uh, migrate more proximally and occluding the right nominate. Similarly, uh, coming to the left uh, carotid also, uh, when, you are, uh, when the surgery is on the left carotid, I can let the left uh, radial artery uh, for the similar reasons. And uh, I put a triple uh, central uh, venous cannula, either the subclavian root or uh, we can take a, you commonly we place a subclavian root in our institute or else we can go for a femoral vein or a uh, peripheral introduced central venous catheter also. Uh, this is mainly because uh, to, to start some vasopressor supports, especially to maintain uh, um, uh, 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 hypertension uh, or else uh, to start some uh, vasodilators in order to bring down the BP. 
similarly uh, and coming to the anesthesia technique so we can use uh, general anesthesia or a local regional anesthesia and uh, uh, there uh, the outcomes are similar in case of uh, morbidity the stroke and the mi this i'll be coming uh, in the subsequent slides so coming to the general anesthesia technique so the advantage of general anesthesia is that airway oxygenation cardio uh, cardiovascular stability and analgesia can be maintained then the arterial carbon dioxide tensions can be adjusted and we try to achieve to maintain normocardia but if our baseline uh, psao2 is higher then we try to keep a PSA, psao2 slightly above normocardia then uh, most of the times airway control is taken by the tracheal intubation but uh, some may use a laryngeal mask airway also and uh, general anest uh, general anesthesia agents uh, in the form of inhalation and iv they have theoretically neuroprotective effects um, and uh, they are helpful uh, and they uh, they maintain cerebral auto regulation up to one mac beyond uh, one mac uh, they may impair cerebral auto regulation and this is very important uh, because uh, the phenomenon of uh, luxury perfusion as well as the stealing can also occur when we are using especially the inhalation agents so coming to the newer agents isoflurane sevoflurane and desflurane they are having less effect on uh, cerebral auto regulation if they are kept below less than one mac and uh, nitrous oxide is always avoided because there is risk of air embolism and increased the cerebral metabolic rate now analgesia is maintained by opioids or else by uh, region uh, or by blocks that's regional anesthesia or by local infiltration now opioids um, we can give form of fentanyl boluses or uh, we can uh, give morphine infusion or fentanyl infusion uh, whereas uh, blocks we can go for a, a, a superficial cervical plexus block or intermittent cervical plexus or a deep cervical plexus block and uh, uh, we try to maintain passive hypothermia where we slightly dip the uh, temperature of the upper part of the body uh, so this is uh, uh, we try to maintain it around 34 to 35 degrees because this increases the ischemic time so one very important thing is the cardiovascular management uh, uh, this is because um, in, in, in the already in a stroke patient, uh, uh, the cerebral tissues, they have lost the autoregulation. There is impaired autoregulation. So now, uh, actually, autoregulation is, um, is a phenomenon where uh, the pressures are maintained. Um, uh, whenever there's a ch uh, the change in the pressures, the cerebral perfusion is still maintained. So usually, it's around 55 to 155 mmHg mean arterial pressures. But once um, then the uh, cerebral autoregulation is uh, impaired, then uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the cerebral blood flow becomes now pressure dependent. So therefore, uh, this should always be kept in mind because if we increase the pressures, um, so then there's uh, the chance of cerebral hyperemia as well as if we decrease the pressure, there is more chance for uh, ce cerebral uh, ischemia. Uh, especially uh, increasing the pressures post uh, the stenotic rem uh, stenosis removal, uh, it leads to uh, cerebral hyper uh, hyperperfusion syndrome in the post-operative period. So this we have to keep in mind. Then similarly, there is reduction in the sympathetic and the baroreceptor activity, resulting in dose-dependent decrease in uh, cardiac output and the BP. Now here, because of this uh, uh, atherosclerosis as well as handling of the um, uh, carotid sinus, uh, the baroreceptor activity becomes impaired. So therefore, uh, uh, whenever there's a, uh, a fluctuation, low BP or whenever there's a uh, high BP, so it, it, it uh, doesn't maintain that uh, sinus reflexes is lost. So therefore, hence, we either we have to uh, uh, require vasopressors or we need a vasodilator if the pressures are going up. So therefore, um, and uh, this cardiovascular instability also can, uh, can lead to uh, stroke, as I already told you, and it can also lead to MI. This is because uh, patients are maybe having uh, coronary artery disease and the increase in the afterload can lead to increase in the left vent, uh, left ventricle and diastolic pressure, therefore leading to the um, uh, 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 leading to myocardial ischemia. So once the hemodynamics is controlled, uh, 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 so prior to the cross clamping, uh, for the cerebral protection strategy, we can give mannitol 0.5 grams per kg. Uh, uh, then uh, heparin 1 mg per kg can, uh, can be given and then ACT always uh, to be maintained above uh, 250 uh, seconds. 
and uh, just before uh, five minutes before the clamp placement we can uh, uh, give thiopentone in the dose of three to five mg per kg now this uh, use of thiopentone will be whenever you're using uh, neuromonitoring especially form of bis or nrs so in bis the advantage of this is that we can note the burst suppression actually uh, we should uh, try to uh, uh, achieve the burst uh, suppression uh, this, uh, so, therefore, a dose of around uh, 5 mg per kg is advocated, but the problem is that if you try to achieve the burst suppression, uh, the hemodynamics will be affected. So, the patient may have may land up in hypotension. So, for that, we have to start. So, therefore, usually uh, we give a dose of around 3 mg per kg thiopentone. So, then uh, when the aortic, uh, when the carotid cross clamp is placed, the BP has to be augmented by about 20% uh, above the patient's baseline. Now, this is because in order to uh, aid in the contralateral circulation and uh, see to that that this uh, systolic uh, blood pressure is uh, maintained below 170 mm of Hg and uh, avoid cere cerebral hyperperfusion during this time by the use of vasopressors or phenylephrine boluses. And uh, post clamp release after uh, endarterectomy, the blood flow is uh, restored onto the epsilateral side. So, therefore, it is prudent to maintain the BP to the normal baseline or slightly maintain to a lower baseline, around 20% uh, below the baseline. So, this is because to prevent um, uh, reperfusion injury. Uh, now, because the stenosis is released and there will be now a normal perfusion to the brain. And that ischemic area, which is already maximally vasodilated, will uh, and with the loss of uh, autoregulation, will we cannot accommodate this uh, uh, this a lot of inflow. So therefore, we have to try to maintain BP on the lower side, especially twenty at least twenty percentage below the baseline pressures. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, in the post-operative period, uh, these patients are prone for uh, uh, hypertension, post-operative hypertension. This is because I have already mentioned because the carotid uh, sinuses are impaired. That is one reason. Second thing, uh, there may be pain for the patient or there may be some full bladder for the patient or um, uh, or or uh, or the posi or or they may can be cervical spondylus patients. They may be having neck pain or rigidity uh, because of the uh, uh, because of the um, position what they have underwent in the surgery. So therefore, all this may lead to uh, tachycardia and hypertension. So the uh, so the problem is that the uh, uh, the suture line may give away and there can be a wound hematoma. So therefore, uh, we have to control the BP so by using SNP or NTG. And the post-operative analgesia can be given by local infiltration, IV paracetamol, or morphine infusion. And uh, and uh, uh, protamine reversal is a controversy. Some people advocate uh, there is no, no requirement of uh, protamine uh, heparin reversal. Um, but uh, in our institute, we advocate half the dose of uh, heparin reversal. So, and... Uh, and extubation and emergence uh, always try to uh, avoid uh, major airways, uh, major swings in the BP and avoid bucking and coughing. So, because uh, this can again precipitate uh, cerebral hyperemia or there can be a wound hematoma um, or uh, 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 so better try to uh, extubate the patient in the deeper plane to prevent these undesirable effects. Now, the surgery can also be done in regional anesthesia. That only ad the best ad the advantage of regional anesthesia is that we can do uh, uh, full-time neuromonitoring. So, you can ask a patient to perform some simple um, uh, uh, maneuvers, uh, like, for example, talking or else uh, move movement of the upper limbs or the lower limbs, movements of the fingers, and as well as the sensory um, uh, perceptions also we can give to, to the patient. So therefore, uh, uh, so therefore, this uh, checks the mental status of the patient, the motor as well as the sensory function of the patient, and this is the best method. But the patient has to be ideally fit for performing the regional anesthesia because the positioning, uh, the the way the neck is turned to one side, and the patient has to be highly cooperative. So now, regional anesthesia can be done under local infiltration, or we can give a superficial intermittent or a deep cervical plexus block where we target the C2 to C4 dermatomes. Um, I'm not going into the details of this. Uh, as well as uh, uh, we can uh, place even the cervical epidural, especially the C6, C7 level, and uh, insert the catheter 4 to 5 centimeters uh, 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 cephalid. And, um, uh, uh, so, and sedation can also be supplemented in the form of uh, opioid uh, boluses 
or or else uh, alpha 2 agonists such as uh, dexmedetomidin infusion as well as a uh, propofol infusion uh, we do use morphine infusion over here so coming to the patient positioning the patient is uh, placed in supine position with the head turned away from the side of the operation with a small roll beneath the shoulder now this uh, we have to bear in mind that elderly age group patients they may be having cervical spondylosis so it will be very uncomfortable for these patients especially when they are done locally uh, so so in the preoperative checkup we all we have to see whether the patient is fit for uh, the regional anesthesia so one of the uh, thing to roll out is uh, this whether the patient we can place in proper position and uh, coming to the dissection uh, i'll just give a brief of this sorry to interrupt uh, dr uh, can you wind up in 2 minutes because you're already exceeding and we are going to we're having another uh, talk yeah, yeah, please proceed, please proceed, uh, if possible. Yeah. So, okay, so coming to the general anesthesia versus regional anesthesia, there was a GALA trial. So, where they had recruited around 3,500 patients um, and they were randomized to undergo carotid endotrectomy under GA or uh, regional. Uh, and the post-operative evaluation was done by a neurologist and the primary outcome which was studied was uh, the proportion of patients with stroke, uh, myocardial infarction or death 30 days after the surgery and the secondary outcome included the length of hospital stay, stroke, MI, death and quality of life at one year uh, after surgery. So they found out that there was no difference. The primary outcome was almost all identical in two groups. That is 4.8 in the general anesthesia group and 4.5% in the regional anesthesia group. And as well as there was no significant differences in the secondary outcomes also, uh, although there was a non-significant lower rate of stroke and MI at one year in the regional anesthesia group. And a meta-analysis showed odd ratio for 30-day stroke or death was similar in both the groups, but regional anesthesia was associated with less post-operative bleed. So now with this study, it was determined that um, now this is uh, preferential. So it depends upon, uh, we can give the choice to the patient or else uh, the surgeon's preference or else uh, we can only decide whether the patient can go for the GA or regional. Uh, so depending upon the uh, condition of the patient. So now coming to uh, a small note on the cerebral uh, perfusion monitoring, uh, several gadgets are there, but the best is always the awake testing where the patient is asked to perform uh, certain, uh, certain tasks. We can also measure the stump pressure, the stump pressure of the ipsilateral side, especially uh, the pressure is measured um, at the level of the uh, 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 internal carotid artery. Uh, so after uh, clamping the ipsilateral common carotid. So, uh, so we try to always maintain the stump pressure more than 40. Less than 40 mm HG is always associated with some neurological outcome. So, and uh, then EEG is uh, also uh, good, but it is always uh, affected uh, by the general anesthesia. And um, as actually, there is always a lag when you're using an EEG for uh, some uh, certain time, uh, so almost all, some uh, around 90 seconds lag. So therefore, um, again, uh, processing also takes some time. So, and therefore it is cumbersome also to use EEG. Then uh, somatosensory evoke potentials can also be done. Uh, this, uh, it reflects, uh, this can uh, uh, measure the, uh, the cortex as well as the deeper structure activity can be known. Then transcranial Doppler, uh, uh, it can be, the probe can be placed on the temporal bone and it uh, takes the measurement of the middle cerebral artery. It monitors the flow as well as the emboli. Uh, but uh, this is also cumbersome because uh, uh, it can it doesn't give continuous monitoring. In our institute, we follow NARS, uh, that is the near infrared spectrometry. That's a regional cerebral oximetry. Uh, we get a continuous monitoring. We usually follow a trend. So any uh, change in the trend by twenty percent is an indication that we have to intervene. Uh, there is some uh, hypoperfusion occurring. Uh, but uh, this is also non-specific. So basically, none of the gadgets are uh, sensitive or. Um, uh, to detect a cerebral ischemia. So the best is always awake testing. And uh, coming to the shunt, uh, this is a inhara uh, uh, purit shunt. So where it consists of uh, uh, two balloons, where uh, one uh, with a pro proximal balloon is placed in the common carotid and the distal balloon is placed in the uh, ICA. So, so this is the uh, picture showing the shunt where uh, 
Uh, this is the uh, common corroded with the proximal balloon space, and this is distal corroded, and this is showing the shunt pressures. Uh, this is just uh, by uh, this is with the mean pressures of 139, uh, uh, with a uh, uh, systolic pressure of uh, 139, we are getting a stump pressure mean around 31. So, here in this case, I had to increase the BP to increase the stump pressure to more than 40, and this is uh, showing the common corroded artery pressures. Okay, so this intermittent is now uh, placing the shunt is either uh, it is sometimes placed by uh, most of the surgeons or else whenever uh, some neurological deficit is, uh, occurs uh, time of clamping of the common carotid artery. So that time some of the surgeon plays the shunt. Um, uh, so these are the two scenarios where the shunt is placed. And uh, coming to the immediate post-operative period, maintain NPO, hydrate the patient well, monitor the vitals, always try to maintain uh, systolic blood pressure less than 120, avoid uh, tachycardia, hypo, uh, hypotension, hypertension, and neuromonitoring is uh, every hourly to be done, and uh, monitor the drain output and any soakage or swelling of the operated side. And coming to the post-operative complications, uh, the, uh, there are two complications where the patient is always shifted back to the OT. One is the thrombosis of the carotid artery, where there is a sudden onset of a major neurological event. So, uh, if, uh, if time permits, um, uh, we can do a CT angio, otherwise we have to do a Doppler ultrasound, which confirms the diagnosis and we have to immediately shift, shift the patient for re-exploration. And the second uh, complication is that there will be a bleeding and neck hematoma which compromises the airway. And uh, if you're planning for a re-exploration, uh, better po possible to do it in uh, local anesthesia. So once the hematoma is uh, removed, the airway obstruction is also uh, relieved. And uh, later on, we can decide whether to go ahead for the intubation or not. And uh, post-operative hypertension uh, develops in about 40% of the patients. They require some form of therapeutic intervention. And if there is un uncontrolled hypertension, then a uh, patient develops a cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome. Uh, this usually occurs within two to seven days after the surgery. And uh, M patient can also develop a perioperative MI, uh, which is responsible for 25 to 50% of all perioperative deaths after carotid endotrectomy. And... Uh, Cranial nerve injuries are also seen, um, uh, especially the hypoglossal nerve, which is uh, most commonly affected because uh, 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 the, these are the nerves which are passing close to the common carotid. And uh, one slide on the cerebral hypoperfusion syndrome. Uh, this is an extreme form of cardiovascular instability. It occurs to about 1% of the patient undergoing uh, carotid endotrectomy, usually 2 to 7 days after surgery. So the patients, they present with hypertensive encephalopathy. Uh, so they, are, uh, they complain of severe headache or they may be neurological deficit, seizures and uh, hypertension. It may be associated with a cardiac event also in the form of MI. So the cause is, uh, as already mentioned, elevated perfusion pressure with impaired uh, cerebral autoregulation in the area of the brain, which are previously underperfused, leads to uh, cerebral edema and cerebral hemorrhage. So our main goal is to reduce the blood uh, systolic blood pressure less than 170 or within 20% of the baseline. We can use uh, labetalol boluses or SNP infusion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, <laughs> excellent and very elaborate. Uh... Uh, since we are running out of time, we'll move on to the next talk and we'll have a discussion at the end. Yes, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Jaffer to proceed for the uh, talk on anatomy of tracheobronchial tree with the FOB guidance. Jaffer, please. Am I audible, sir? Good evening. Yeah, audible. Very well. Very well. Please go ahead. Uh, good yeah, good evening, uh, respected seniors and uh, uh, colleagues and uh, postgraduates. So I will be quickly discussing in the next 20, 15 minutes about the anatomy of tracheal, tracheal bronchial tree. So we will revisit the uh, basic anatomy, which we already know. Then I will be telling some of the clinical significance of various measurements that are there. And finally, uh, we will uh, just orient to the bronchoscopic anatomy. So that is the aim of this class. So tracheal bronchial tree. Uh, so trachea uh, starts from the C6 to T5, upper border of T5, uh, anatomically from the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. And in adult, it is usually 12 to 15 centimeter long. And in neonates, we can find 3 to 4 centimeter. And pediatric population, it is 7 to 10 centimeter. So what is the significance of this? Because from the uh, length of in uh, incisor to the vocal cord, usually around 15 centimeter. And if the trachea is 15, I mean uh, 12 to 15 centimeter long, and if we aim to uh, 
uh, place the tube at the mid trachea. So it is usually half of the trachea. So the uh, approximately six plus 15 or 14, so roughly around 20. So usually around 18 to 20 in adult female and 20 to 22 in adult male. So that is the significance of knowing the length of this trachea. And this length of this trachea can be obtained from either a basic chest X-ray or in the CT. Uh, and it is uh, histologically covered by the ciliated columnar epithelium, which helps in the movement of cilia to sweep the uh, dust or whatever uh, foreign materials that is there. Next is uh, the measurements. Uh, usually the tracheal diameter will be around 19 to 22 mm uh, diameter. And length I have already told that is 12 to 15 centimeter in an adult. And the uh, angle that is found by the main stem bronchi, that is right side and left side. In the adults, it is 25 degree right side and 45 degree left side. So what is the significance of this? Right side, it is more in line with the trachea. So there are higher chances that the endotracheal tube it gets passed into the right bronchus. There can be a bronchial intubation. But in children, as we see, the angle found by both the bronchi, a main stem bronchi are almost equal, that is 55 degrees. So there are 50% chances that uh, the tube can enter into the right and 50% chances that it can enter into the left. So that is the significance of knowing this. Then, so uh, the trachea moves with respiration and also with the alteration of the position of the head. So what is the significance of knowing this? Uh, uh, the uh, te uh, textbook of Barash says that uh, when the patient is fully flexed and when the patient is fully extended, there is a movement of tube approximately around 0.7 centimeter up to 5.5 centimeter. So in the extreme extension, even the endotracheal tube can come out into the pharynx. And in the extreme flexion, there are higher chances that it can get into the bronchus. So uh, uh, the idea of behind knowing this is the carina is the mobile structure and it can be uh, affected even in the laparoscopic surgeries when the mediastinum shifts up and the end of the tube can get into the bronchus. So I will not go much about the uh, physiology. So we know that there is a, a 23 generations of airway starting from trachea until the alveolar sac up to 16 is the conducting zone and from 17 to 23 is the respiratory zone. So respiratory zone is the one that takes uh, place and uh, takes part in the gas exchange and up to 16 is the conducting zone that uh, forms the dead space, anatomical dead space. So I will not go much about the physiology. So I'll straight away start with the fibroscopic tracheobronchial anatomy. So why do we need to uh, know about the fibroscopic tracheobronchial anatomy? One is to, uh, when we see a pathology in the lung radiograph, chest radiograph, so the similar thing can, should be, we should be able to correlate when we do a bronchoscopy. So for that, we need to know, and we have, we need to know what are all the uh, segments that is affected uh, so that we can uh, guide the surgeons for uh, surgery and uh, 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 then localizing the lung pathology either with the uh, uh, radiographically or live through the bronchoscopically. So uh, coming to the basic uh, uh, tracheobronchial anatomy, that is uh, trachea divides into uh, right and left main stem bronchi. This main stem bronchi gives rise to the segmental bronchus, that is right side there are three segmental bronchus, right upper, right middle and right lower. Left side there is left upper and left lower. So left side, the upper low, uh, upper main uh, segmental bronchi has got upper division and the lower division. Upper division gives rise to the upper lobe, lower division gives rise to the lingular lobe. Now, so we can perform this bronchoscopy either in an awake patient who is well, whose upper airway is well anesthetized through an endoscopic mask, or it can be conventionally done through an endotracheal tube, or it can be done, uh, done through an LMA, or it can be done through the tracheostomy. So in all this, uh, finally, we are going to land into the zone called as carina, but the starting point will differ. So if we are doing in the uh, awake patient, so the starting point after, as soon as we reach the pharynx is the tip of the epiglottis. This is the first airway structure we are going to see. That is the tip of the epiglottis. As we proceed further, I hope we, uh, uh, my cursor is visible. So the next uh, thing is the uh, larynx. So here we got posteriorly aryepiglottic fold and anteriorly glossopiglottic fold and the pearly white structure that is called as the vocal cord and the pink uh, structure that is called as the false vocal cord. So as we proceed further, we will enter into this vocal cord and the space formed uh, between this vocal cord is called as the remoglottidis. And when we pass uh, uh, further along the vocal cord, we enter into the subglottic space and we can see a complete ring below the vocal cord. So this is the 
complete ring in the uh, airway that is one and only cricoid cartilage. So this area from the glottis to cricoid is called as the subglottic area. Next, moving on to the trachea, fibroscopic anatomy of trachea. So trachea, how can we identify it is trachea? Trachea is usually a D-shaped structure and the flat portion is posterior and it is covered by the trachealis muscle. Anterolaterally, it is covered by at least 16 to 20 incomplete tracheal rings. So, uh, and uh, uh, next important thing which we have to know here is there are certain things uh, we can find, like in tracheoesophageal fistula, we can find a fistula here. Why to identify the fistula? So that we can put the cuff of the endotracheal tube past the uh, uh, fistula. Then, then what is the diameter of uh, trachea? I have already told that is 90 to 20, uh, 22 mm. So uh, we need to know the diameter of the right and left bronchus also. So uh, diameter of right bronchus, uh, left bronchus, in most of the studies it says that it is 66 percentage of the trachea. So uh, and the right main bronchus is it is 88 percent. It is easy to remember that is 88 percent right side, uh, 66 percent left side. So 88 percentage of 22 uh, is 17.5. That is the uh, usual diameter of the right main stem bronchus and 14.5 uh, around is the left main stem bronchus. So why we need to know the uh, diameter of bronchus so that we can uh, choose the adequate size DLT and also choose adequate size cuff of the DLT. Next is the uh, carina. So trachea divides into carina. Uh, these uh, D-shaped cartilages uh, divides into right, uh, right main stem and the left main stem. So what is the uh, significance of knowing this carina so that we can position the DLT and also the bronchial blockers. So left side and the left upper image, we see the DLT. So uh, in the left side of DLT, uh, bronchial, I mean, usually the bronchial lumen will be blue in color and the tracheal lumen will be white in color. That is translucent, translucent tracheal, uh, bronchial blue. So we can remember like that. So what is the ideal position? So the ideal position is a small crescent of blue uh, uh, cuff that is bulging outside of the bronchus. That is the normal position. So if the, uh, this uh, cuff is bulging more into the right side, so it can hamper the airway passage of the uh, right side, main, main stem. And if it is too inside, as in the next picture, uh, some of the bronchus, like if it, if the cuff is too inside, only the left upper low bronchus will get uh, ventilated, but the left uh, lower lobe will not get ventilated. So we have to know the length. So next important question is the length of the mainstem bronchus. So length of the right mainstem bronchus is usually 2.5 centimeter and length of the uh, left mainstem bronchus is usually 5 centimeter. So this 5 centimeter will give us a good margin of safety for us to position the left DLT. If we, are, if we are going to place the right DLT, so what is the issue? So this will be the issue. If you are going to put the right DLT, this cuff may uh, encroach onto the right upper lobe bronchus, which I will discuss next. Uh, and there will be hampering of ventilation to the right upper lobe. But as we can see the left main stem bronchus, it is long enough to accommodate the big uh, uh, long endotracheal tube uh, DLT. So we can comfortably place the left DLT without any issue. No. So, fibroscopically, we are going to uh, see the right main stem bronchus. So, yeah, I hope you can uh, see this simulator. Now we are exactly at the carina. Now I'm going into the right main stem bronchus. I'm going into the right main stem bronchus. So, this is the right main stem bronchus. And uh, at three o'clock, direction, I will get the right upper lobe. At the three o'clock position, I will get the right upper lobe. And this is the only place in the lung which has the three openings. That is apical, anterior and posterior. So this is the only place in the lung which has got the three openings. That is right upper lobe, which is at the three o'clock position. Now I will come out and yeah, I, I have come down, uh, come out to the right main stem bronchus now. So this is the RC1, that is secondary carina, one of the right side. Now I will move into the, the place called as bronchus intermedius. That is after the take up of right upper lobe bronchus, it is called as a bronchus intermediates, where we get both middle lobe and the lower lobe. So what I get in the uh, 12 o'clock position is the middle lobe. So in this, it is not at 12 o'clock, but usually you'll get it uh, at 12 o'clock. So that is the middle lobe. 
right middle lobe and it is usually anterior so we need to remember that right middle lobe is always anterior so right middle lobe has got uh, medial and lateral segment and and this is the rc2 which divides the middle and lower lobe bronchus and lower lobe has got superior yeah this is superior so superior part of lower lobe is always at the posterior so this is the main uh, area for aspiration to occur so we need to look at that part so superior is very important and next important thing is if middle lobe is at 12 o'clock position superior lobe or lower lobe will be usually at six o'clock they will be die and they will be 180 degree so that is the importance of right main stem bronchus so we have covered upper lobe middle lobe lower lobe now i'll come back to the carina come back to the carina now i will enter into the left main stem bronchus so as i already told it is very long that is 5 cm it can accommodate yeah so left side at so right side we saw that 3 o'clock is the right upper lobe and in the left side we should get the upper lobe at 9 o'clock position in this it is not oriented but as you see in the left side you, you usually get at 9 o'clock position then I will get the lower lobe. Yeah. So this is the lower lobe, superior part, superior, superior, which is usually at six o'clock position where aspiration contains stay. So this is all about the fibroscopy. So next important thing which I want to convey is so directly if I put an endotracheal tube. And my first vision is this. So will I tell this as right bronchus and left bronchus? No. So how will I confirm? There are not a definitive trickle rings. So and then I will uh, proceed inside and see. So immediately I'm getting these two bronchus. That, that means I'm so there is somewhere an error. So I have to come back and verify where I'm at. So for that. So for that, Dave Pilchers has given a good definitions. So the trachea is D-shaped and the flat wall is posterior. And the right middle lobe bronchus is anterior, as I already told you, that is at 12 o'clock position. And the apical segment of both lobe bronchus will be posterior, that is at 6 o'clock position. If in doubt, always go back to the carina to check where you are. So to summarize, the trachea starts from the lower border of cricoid extends till C5, uh, T5, uh, upper border of T5, divides into two main stem bronchi, right upper lobe usually uh, originates at 3 o'clock position, and it is 1 to 1.5 centimeter from the carina, so we it is very difficult to position the DLT. Left side is usually 5 centimeter, and we can easily position the DLT. Right side, the uh, upper lobe is the only one uh, part which has got the three opening, that is apical, anterior and posterior, and uh, uh, the right middle lo lobe, which is usually 12 o'clock, and lower lobe, superior part of lower lobe is at the 6 o'clock position, and superior Part, uh, lobe of both the bronch uh, lung is the uh, main area where the aspiration gets collected. So that is the take home point from this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jaffer. It is a very illustrative talk, very useful for all the postgraduates. Thank you very much. I think we can have the discussion. Shall you proceed, sir? Or Time. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Finish up the chat box questions first. Yeah, okay, sir. Jaffer, can you uh, can you yes and share your slides? You stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, all the speakers, because uh, they, they, they did a fantastic job. The collection of slides and collection of materials and excellent slides and excellent uh, convey of message to all the audience. It is worth attending. No doubt because Sri Chitra is known for excellent uh, academic feast. Thank you very much Dr. Sarana Babu, Dr. Don and uh, Dr. Jaffer. Uh, there are a few questions from the chat box. Uh, for the Dr. Sarana Babu, how to proceed for cardiopulmonary bypass in an awake uh, patient? proceeding for anterior medial mass. I think you have explained everything clearly. 
but anyway for the sake of completion please proceed yeah uh, you all know that this uh, cardiac pulmonary bypass and it more is needed only for the high risk patients first we have to counsel the patients and make him to understand or her understand like like how how, how we are going to proceed what we are going to do and the second thing is that after giving the reassurance for the patient and then uh, we can make the patient to lie comfortable in i mean like it always needs a supine position that's one of the challenging uh, part in this if the patient is having a supine symptoms or may have to position in such a way that patient can able to tolerate or something and we have to proceed with the local anesthesia it depends upon the institutional practice if uh, uh, if you are uh, able to do with the percutaneous cannulation for the ecmo or uh, cpv you can do it otherwise we have to give a, a local anesthesia or we can go for a femoral nerve blocks and uh, we can open and access the vessels and uh, uh, give some heparin through the vein in the hand or something and then we can cannulate the vessels for the cardiac pulmonary bypass so it's always a tricky but patient some patient may not be uh, so much comfortable in those cases as i already told the principal here like we have to monitor, slow maintain the spontaneous ventilation give little bit of minimal sedation watching for any airway collapse or any hemodynamic compromise so that's the only job it's always a tricky one but that's the option available for inducing a high risk patient it's always giving a local or femoral nerve block and minimal sedation and reassuring the patient and once we establish the bypass then you can give the drug and induce the patient thank you thank you very much uh chairperson sir chairperson sir dr thomas koshi is yeah, here koshi sir is there i saw him i saw him good evening welcome he can supplement <laughs> dr koshi <laughs> koshi sir you can unmute no problem good evening sir good evening welcome yeah good evening good evening nice to hear uh, lectures yes yeah, i didn't hear a surround us lectures i joined late i heard the uh, the other two lectures uh, all three everything. all three did a fantastic job sir but you were you were no, PG no, no, no. is uh, taken over everyone your pg is too good <laughs> <laughs> because it is very basic <laughs> it is very basic it is nice uh, you can proceed chair person sir yes yeah. sir uh, the next question is when there is obstruction of esophagus there is no question of te when there is obstruction there is that is an absolute contraindication yeah. so nothing to add on that and uh, there are a lot of questions for the carotid endarterectomy how frequently carotid endarterectomy is done in sichitra from dr krishna and krishna is our uh, hod of cardiac surgery at minakshi he has asked many questions from the carotid endarterectomy is doing lot of carotid that is why he has been into carotid endarterectomy uh, then the, the, the better question uh, i observed is when there is a bilateral significant disease carotid stenosis how yeah. to approach it? sir actually we have to see the site which is having more stenosis sir. so that will be taken care of uh, and uh, the other the other contralateral site will be done after 6 weeks sir minimum 6 weeks we wait so if there is a symptomatic bilateral yeah, there is a symptomatic stenosis. bilateral so the the site which is having the uh, uh, more amount of stenosis that, that, that is what i assume if, if it is more than 70% on bilateral how to proceed is there any anything like that or we can proceed one side and then after 6 weeks we can proceed for another side hello sir hello. can you hear me yeah please sir hello the don please it is breaking for you uh, can you hear me sir yeah okay please sir uh, the wifi connection is again problem sir sir yeah, actually yeah. Uh, the site which is uh, having uh, more stenosis sir uh, so for example if the site is if one, if one of the site is having around uh, 80% stenosis and the other site contralateral site is having around 70% stenosis first we address the 80% uh, stenosis site we wait for a period of 6 weeks and then we address the contralateral site sir so 6 weeks is a waiting period that is what uh, we follow here have you observed any uh... preoperative stroke in a bilateral stenosis patient undergoing uh, one side uh, cardiac endarterectomy because the circular will is is not perfect uh sir uh, no sir this bilateral stenosis stroke i have not observed but i have uh, seen for one patient sir immediate post operative period fresh thrombus was formed so and um, we actually extubated the patient in the ot and we shifted to the ic but within one hour patient developed a neurological deficit and aphasia so again we had to take back the patient uh, to the ot sir 
Okay, another quick question. What about the neuro monitoring in carotid endotectomy? What what is uh, you, you what you are following in uh, Chitra? We are following uh, use of NIRS, regional cerebral oximetry. Okay. So, yes, so, okay. Case, so we after the induction, sir, we record the baseline and keep. So then, and then we follow the trend and any change in the baseline more than twenty percent. This especially at the time of uh, clamping. Uh, we see, sir. And if there is a fall in the baseline, then it is the time to increase the uh, pressure, sir, for the contralateral perfusion. Or else, okay. sir, uh, the surgeon, uh, some of the, they prefer the shunt also, sir. Here in Chitra, we put the shunt, uh, there is uh, for all patients. But a certain uh, surgeon, sir, uh, whenever there is a fall in the nerves or in an awake patient, when they were the patient is developing some uh, neuro neurological deficit, they put the shunt immediately, sir. And then uh, the nerves will improve. As well as the uh, patient uh, condition will also improve, sir. If the patient is awake. Okay, thank you. Do you monitor stump pressure for all patients or only in selected patients? Uh, monitor for uh, uh, we do for all, sir. This we monitor for all patients. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question: When you go for a combined carotid endotectomy with CABG, which one you prefer yeah. to go? Whether you proceed for separate or you go for combined one? If it is you are going for combining one, which one to bust? Sir, um, uh, so certain patients, uh, like uh, if the patient is uh, symptomatic, having more than 70% disease, um, uh, we definitely go ahead, sir. Or else even asymptomatic patient, more than 70% also we go, sir. So when it when patient is posted for CABG, first we do the carotid endotectomy. And after that, we don't close the wound. Uh, we will uh, give half reversal, sir, and uh, with the protamin, we don't close the wound. And then we do the CABG, sir. And after giving complete protamin after bypass, then only we close the uh, carotid uh, that wound, sir. Do you follow the strategy of uh, half protamine in uh, after bypass also, or uh, no, sir? Like uh, initially, is that um, uh, we give half protamine, sir, before we go on uh, uh, before the we do a st sternotomy, sir. And then after that, uh, we give the full protamine for going on bypass. Okay, so that is because that we need to that to prevent the bleed initial period of bleed. Sir. There are two questions about anesthesia. The cervical plexus plus how you are performing now? How, how much the dose to be given? Sir, uh, so we perform uh, superficial as well as uh, intermediate. Sir, deep we are not performing, sir. And the dose, sir, uh, around uh, I give 20 ml, sir. Uh, 20 ml of 0.25 uh, liver bupivacaine uh, with uh, fentanyl, sir. Okay, thank you. So any other clarification, sir? I think I covered uh, almost everything quickly. Because we are... Sir, they, are, they have asked uh, how frequently it is done in Chitra Trinal. That the main question they have to answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can yeah, uh, we do it around, around twice a week, sir. Fantastic. Uh, twice a week. So monthly around uh, seven to eight cases we do, sir. So within how many hours we have to reach you after developing stroke? So that we inform our relatives. When we no, have to actually, reach, what, what actually for uh, strategy of doing in, uh, in, in acute stroke patients. If patients are referred by the stroke unit, uh, stroke department is there. The patient primarily go to the neurologist. Neurology refers, evaluate and refer the case to the vascular surgeon. So once it is uh, done. Whether the patient recover completely, what is the recovery rate you have seen from the neurological deficit? I am asking. Sir, uh, neurological deficit, sir, around uh, around it's only around two to three percent only, sir. Oh. So most of the patients have complete recovery, sir. But uh, some patients, yes, sir, the cognitive dysfunction might be there, sir. But uh, major stroke or any ischemic uh, changes or new neurological deficit is around 2%, 2-3%. Two no, oh, oh, my basic question is, when you find an acute stroke, patient landed with acute uh, stroke of 24 hours duration. In yes, that sir. situation, when you find carotid stenosis, do you proceed yes, straight away or you want to wait for some more time and establish the patient mm -hmm. and then go mm -hmm. ahead to the carotid Stroke, stroke, if patient develops strokes, uh, it's an indication, it's an emergency indication. Okay. So you have to no need to wait. Everything is stable and patient is. Uh, we have to uh, do as early as possible. Sir, in the CT scan, if uh, there is no large lesion, sir, then uh, and if the patient is medically stable, then we can uh, take up for surgery, sir, immediately. 
No, even uh, the question is whether uh, the time of admission decides the outcome of surgery, I am asking. The time of admission, that is, if suppose uh, that the hemiplegia is due to thrombus, we use alteplase like that. If the patient yeah, has a stroke uh, with this uh, carotid plaque, if he is yeah, immediately that's... coming to the chitrathrenal, whether the outcome is different, are admitted somewhere else, uh, referred after seven days, whether the outcome is different, I'm asking. If, if the stroke is because of this carotid artery stenosis, uh, uh, and if the uh, CT is showing uh, uh, not a major infarct, sir, we can take up immediately, sir. But if it is a case of thrombus which is proven, sir, then the patient can go for uh, thrombolysis, sir. So if it is only because of carotid and uh, this carotid artery stenosis, then definitely, sir, we can take up a surgery. Okay, thank you, sir. I think we, we have exceeded twenty minutes as per uh, from the schedule. <laughs> any any other clarification, sir? What is your input from Koshi, sir? No, I have done uh, these procedures are routinely done here, so like anti remediation mass, uh, crowd bladder me and. Uh, Fibrotic bronchoscopy is uh, the routine, so everybody is used to it. And, uh, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, Jafra has uh, covered that uh, very, he's our uh, second year resident, he's very covered nice. uh, very nicely. And uh, our uh, poor postgraduate is uh, listening to this talk, you can go for this vestibular bronchoscopy. It is in the website by the Toronto General Hospital. Peter Slinger is the person who made it as a thoracic anesthesiologist and it's very useful to uh, learn uh, virtual bronchoscopy. And it's free. Is it Sharona? It's, Sharona, is it free now? No? Yeah, yeah, it's free, sir. It is easily accessible to anyone. And uh, that is the center of Sharona went for a fellowship program. This is the same center. Toronto General Hospital. Peter Slinger is an authority on thoracic anesthesia. Yeah. So definitely it is. And he's made it free also, yes. Sir. It is useful for all the postgraduates. Hey, uh, can we wind up? Sir, uh, yeah. thank you then, uh, Dr. Kumar. I thank uh, the chairperson, Dr. Kumar, and all the three faculty. Today is an interesting day because that a postgraduate has uh, projected the bronchoscopy very nicely for the simple reason. So far, all the bronchoscopy, the patients will be bucking and they will be moving. But as this is a simulator, it was very clear. So, the, see, the way in which he has presented, that is very nice. The way in which he is presented, it is very nice. He will also become a good teacher like uh, Dr. Don and Dr. Sarvana Babu. Now, I have to thank Dr. Koshi, who has introduced Dr. Sarvana Babu to me. See, Dr. Sarvana Babu is from Tamil Nadu. He was introduced to me by Dr. Koshi. See, this sort of academic performance, definitely the like-minded like the like-minded people. So we are vibrating at the same wavelength. I am also happy from Chitra Thirunal, they are participating in Putukote Buddha. And I don't know in what website this bronchoscopy is uh, shown, but from tomorrow onwards, in ISA Putukote Buddha YouTube link, this video will be shown. So, we will send the link uh, tomorrow. That can be sent to all the people. Uh, it is also a news for me that the bronchoscopy is shown as in the website, like uh, Bhavani Shankar Kodali's uh, capnograph. So, that is the exchange of idea. I am really very happy today. And uh, Dr. Sarvana Babu, even though he is an anesthetist, he is initially his MS. Even in the flyer, we could not change that MS was <laughs> printed as if it is a degree. But uh, my designer has taken uh, time and again, that is the reason why I was waiting for posting the thing. But 69 people attended uh, this means it is a great uh, tribute to Chitra Dhrinal. And people who have not seen Carotid Endotrectomy, he has clearly mentioned uh, what is what. And anti media Slumas, really all the three are exam questions. Uh, so, Dr. Koshi's team has done very well and we are immensely happy. Uh, now, I hand over uh, the session to our uh, president, Dr. Suresh Kumar. I request Dr. David to propose formal vote of thanks. Yes, 
குட் ஈவினிங் சார் குட் ஈவினிங் டு ஆல் பிகாஃப் ஆஃப் ஏசிய புதுக்கோட்டை ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஐ வுட் லைக் டு தேங்க் அவர் அகடமிக் சேர்மன் டாக்டர் ஏஎல்எம் சார் ஃபார் சக்சஸ்ஃபுல் கண்டக்டிங் தேர்ட்டி தேர்ட் வெபினார் அண்ட் ஸ்பெஷல் தேங்க்ஸ் டு டுடே சேர் பர்சன் டாக்டர் எஸ் குமார் சார் ஹெட் கார்டியக் அண்ட் ஃபிசியாலஜி அண்ட் கிரிட்டிகல் கேர் மீனாட்சி மிஷன் ஹாஸ்பிட்டல் மதுரை அண்ட் அகடமிக் சேர்மன் ஐஏசி தமிழ்நாடு ஃபார் ஷேரிங் இஸ் நியூஸ் தேங்க் யூ சார் ஐ ஆல்சோ ஐ லைக் டு தேங்க் டுடே ஸ்பீக்கர்ஸ் டாக்டர் சரவணம் பாபு சார் அண்ட் டாக்டர் டான் ஜோஸ் சார் அண்ட் டாக்டர் முகமது ஜாஃபர் ஃப்ரம் ஸ்ரீ Chitra Thirunal Institute for a wonderful academic session and also thank other faculties, postgraduate and IQRL and AVO Logics for technical support. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. AVO Logics can end the meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you